Instead, today we will start with a daily update from cabinet ministers and federal health officials on Ottawa's response to the pandemic. It's expected in about 15 minutes' time. The reason the prime minister is not uh, addressing the nation outside of his home today is that he will be found inside the House of Commons at around 12.15, speaking to some critical wage subsidy legislation. It's already been a busy morning uh, in Ottawa and on Parliament Hill just over an hour ago. CBC News uh, was able to report that the Trudeau government had, in fact, reached a deal with opposition parties to pass that emergency wage subsidy package. And that vote will be happen a little bit later today after we hear from the prime minister and leaders of the opposition. All right, let me bring in my colleague, Catherine Cullen of the Parliamentary Bureau, who um, actually broke this story uh, online. Good to see you, Catherine. So what, what do we know about um, how they managed to reach this agreement? Because it did take a little while. That's right. This was, frankly, a little bit of a nail-biter, certainly for anybody who is following this aspect of the situation closely. And we appreciate there is a lot going on in the context of this pandemic. But this is an incredibly important piece of legislation. Everybody agrees, right? This wage subsidy legislation that is going to allow so many Canadians to retain at least a portion of their income. And the government hopes keep a lot of Canadians attached uh, to their employer, remain on the payroll thanks to this money. Now, we know that there were negotiations going on with all the parties that particularly Particularly, the discussions with the Conservatives seem to be the last ones that to, to, to finally reach an agreement. But we do understand now from the opposition parties, from the Liberals, uh, that there is unanimous consent to get this legislation passed this afternoon. That, in fact, we expect the whole process only to take a few hours, Rosemary. There were some changes made based on requests from the various opposition parties, the NDP, the Bloc, the Conservatives. Um, but there is another discussion that continues to go on through all of this. And we heard Andrew Scheer talking about it not too long ago. A discussion that has now clearly been hived off because there was some question of whether or not the wage subsidy bill would be stopped by a discussion about the role of Parliament and MPs continuing to meet. Andrew Scheer said very uh, clearly that they want to have that discussion separately. This needs to go forward today. Uh, so certainly we can expect in this briefing that there's going to be questions for the government uh, about this whole process, why it was such a nail biter, what the ultimate results are and questions about other issues. Of course, today we're seeing some very disturbing stories about the state of um, some facilities across the country. I think uh, immediately of one in Montreal's West Island, where we've heard of a couple, it's a long-term care facility, we've heard about a couple of seniors who have passed away, more deaths that do not yet have a cause, and the seniors there being left in terrible circumstances. Um, another story out of Markham, Ontario, in the, uh, around the Toronto area of a facility for uh, adults uh, with physical disabilities and uh, intellectual disabilities, and of staff there. Some confusion about whether initially reported as a walkout, the union for the staff now saying they were told that they could go home and self-quarantine, but not enough staff there to support yeah. people. So uh, I think we can also expect to see some non-political questions about that today. Yeah, lots of obviously concern for long-term uh, care centers where uh, many, many deaths have occurred uh, and also for any kind of location where people are in a concentrated space and, and can't uh, get get extra space to self-isolate or contain the outbreak. Um, the, the last time the House sat was March 24th. It was to pass the CERB, which people started applying for uh, at Monday of last week, and they've st that started to roll out pretty seamlessly by all accounts. Um, this is, is a much more substantive package uh, in terms of economic aid, 71, 71 billion dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe just walk us through what is on the table right now and, and how this is going to help businesses, Catherine. Well, the idea is, as I said earlier, that employees can now stay attached to their businesses. So it's a wage subsidy that, it, that businesses, initially we were talking about small, medium-sized businesses, now it's businesses of all size, can apply for this wage subsidy. The government gives them money up to 75% uh, of the amount on their payroll, and the government is encouraging businesses to top that up and to continue to pay their employees their full salary with this help from the government, although uh, officials have acknowledged that it may not be the case that all government, uh, that all businesses, rather, can do that. And this is considered by the government to be a, a key part of uh I want to say keeping the economy intact. I'm not sure that's quite the right way to describe it, but certainly to to keep people attached to their employers. You know, we heard Justin Trudeau, um, was it earlier this week? It's all blurring together, Rosemary, just a few days ago, uh, talking about wanting the economy to come roaring back when this was all uh, over. 
that may be a little bit optimistic, but certainly the intent of this wage subsidy legislation is to try to, A, uh, keep, keep people receiving some kind of income, some kind of comparable income to what they've been getting, even if they are no longer working, but also to position businesses to move forward when we start to see a little bit of a, a, a slackening of some of these uh, physical social distancing restrictions. Yeah, so the CERB became a much smaller a portion of money, and, and the wage subsidy program on the table has become much larger to, as you say, encapsulate businesses of all kinds. Um, and the government loosened, we've seen them loosen the criteria through through time as, it, as it's been clear that it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, capture everybody. So they went from uh, having to show a 30 percent drop in revenue from over March of last year to now making it 15 percent. And you can use January, February or March as proof of that drop of revenue. Um, so that sort of relaxes the criteria and particularly allows I would suspect newer businesses uh, to tap into this as well. But as you rightly said, it's not just small businesses. Air Canada has signaled they're going to use it. WestJet has signaled they're going to use it. Uh, so it's really any business uh, that can try and maintain that, that, that payroll connection, as you point out. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to leave it there just for a moment, if you don't mind. Um, the Prime Minister will be in the House today, as I said, instead of his daily briefing at 11.15, he will address Canadians from the floor of the House of Commons, as will the uh, official opposition leader, Andrew Scheer, Jagmeet Singh, and the bloc leader, uh, Yves-Francois Blanchet. So all those people will be speaking to this legislation and, and probably more broadly to some of the concerns that they have around how the pandemic is being managed uh, by the government. And as Catherine talked about, there are on ongoing conversations about how to do that on a more regular basis. But we haven't seen the Prime Minister in the House of Commons because he was self-isolating uh, the last time Parliament convened. So this will be his first time uh, there in some weeks. Um, as we wait to hear from federal officials, cabinet ministers and public health officials, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the challenges for frontline workers that we're trying to highlight uh, every day as much as we can here on CBC. Dr. Melissa Ewan Innes is an emergency physician at the Glengarry Memorial Hospital in Alexandria, Ontario, and she joins me now. Nice to see you, doctor. Thank you, you too. So I know uh, one of the things that you are most concerned about, and certainly we've heard this from other nurses and doctors, is personal protective equipment. And you uh, launched a petition a number of weeks ago raising that concern. Where are things at now in terms of your concern? Well, we can see that we're starting to run low on protective equipment as anticipated. So at my hospital, we're running low on surgical masks. We've run out of the masks with visors for eye protection. Um, and our paramedics don't have any masks at all. And our long-term care facilities also are re really short. So when you raise this uh, with the provincial authorities, uh, health authorities, or the provincial government, what is the response? So what they end up telling us is that they're working on it. You know, one of them said, it's like a duck. We look calm, but we're paddling madly underneath. Mm -hmm. And I was glad to see that they are, you know, working with Canadian businesses to pivot. We are trying to import or get donations to try and cover this. But I have to say that on the ground, we're not seeing a lot of the actual equipment arriving to us yet. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking for that. So there, there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect because the, just this week, the government uh, got millions of masks, both surgical masks and N95 masks, uh, into the country. Obviously, that has to be distributed through the system uh, in terms of who needs it. But do you think it's just a matter of it hasn't gotten to you yet or there is some sort of uh, lack of communication around what hospitals are running low? What do you think the actual problem is? Well, they have stepped it up. Up. So at first, our hospital was counting daily, uh, sorry, was counting weekly, and now they're counting daily. And then they go to the region, and the region goes to the province, and the, I guess the province goes to the federal level. So there are a lot of layers, and I know that my hospital won't be a big priority because we're really small, and we don't have a lot of COVID-positive patients. So it will percolate down eventually, but if we could get more transparency about what has arrived, mm -hmm. when and where it's going to be distributed, that would really help us a lot so that we could plan in advance. So you, you said that your hospital is smaller, doesn't have many COVID-19 patients right now. Uh, what are your concerns going forward? Uh, do, do you think that there will be a surge in, in your hospital and how prepared are you for that? We are expecting it. Our, our region is in a state of emergency. We know that there is community spread. So it's just a matter of time. You know, we're all doing our best and washing our hands and covering ourselves and hoping that we won't get too high volumes. We're just trying to 
ask people to stay home and flatten the curve in the meantime so that mm -hmm. we don't have to brace ourselves for that rush. I've also heard, and I know you've talked about it too, people stealing stuff from, from hospitals. I don't know if that's still happening or whether you guys have moved to lock down some of this equipment. I guess people may be in a, a fearful state just taking what they can get their hands on. Well, I hadn't touched base with the hospital later about what happened with that, but we did have people stealing the hand sanitizer out of the dispensers on the walls. So what happened was in that segment of the hospital where we don't have as much staff, they just stopped stalking them. Mm. There isn't any hand sanitizer there anymore. Um, and the, the yeah. masks and stuff are locked up. Yeah. How worried are you uh, about your own health? If you have concerns about the equipment that you need to protect yourself, how worried about are you about your health? Well, I am a little bit concerned because uh, some of my friends have gotten more of the personal respirators so that they know that they'll be covered if their hospital runs out of masks. I didn't get one and now they're sold out. Hmm. So I am trusting a bit in the system that they're going to get me the equipment because otherwise it's not safe to work and do aerosolized procedures knowing that we could be inhaling COVID-19. What would you say to uh, to Canadians right now? It's it's you know it's this Easter long weekend. Many people are uh, struggling to stay at home and trying their best to follow messages from public health officials. What would you say to Canadians? Yes, please keep that up. I know it's tough. I know you want to do your Easter egg hunts and go to your <laughs> services and everything like that. Um, but if you can stay the course and stay home and just isolate with your little group that you live with. Um, we just did an Easter egg hunt with just our own family. Normally we do a multi-family Easter egg hunt, but we had to put that off this year and uh, just tell them the Easter Bunny will try and hit more houses next year. <laughs> I'm sure he will. Okay, Dr. Melissa Ewan Innes, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Melissa Ewan is an emergency physician in Glengarry. Okay, uh, as we wait for our uh, federal update from cabinet ministers and public health officials uh, at 11.15 today, instead of the prime minister, who will instead be inside the House of Commons at 12.15 uh, to talk about the wage subsidy legislation, just want to quickly touch base with my colleague Katie Simpson in Washington for an update on the situation in the United States. Katie, uh, the U.S. reporting more cases than anywhere else in the world right now. Are there any uh, signs of optimism or hope or the curve slowing down in any way there? The numbers out of the United States, Rosie, are obviously staggering, but within there, there are some little glimmers of hope, particularly out of New York City, where, of course, in New York State itself, there are more cases there than any other country, country, state versus country, outside of the United States. But what the governor of New York State has been saying, Andrew Cuomo, is that they are starting to see the flattening of the curve. Uh, of the curve. They're starting to see lower numbers of hospitalized they're starting to see lower numbers of patients requiring ICU stays, requiring intubation. And in other hot spots in the United States, including the city of Chicago in Illinois, that is also a place where the numbers are slowly starting to drop. The mayor of Chicago saying uh, that perhaps if this trend continues, they won't hit the peak that they had been anticipating. And we're starting to see a shifting of resources in the United States. The mayor of New York City saying they believe they now have enough ventilators to at least mm. get them through the next eight days that the, the the surge that they had been anticipating is it isn't there right now so uh they they are cautiously optimistic and they are going to continue to monitor the situation but they're saying that there are signs that physical distancing is actually starting to work and it's working so well in some places including the state of california they're actually shipping ventilators from california where they say they don't have the need and they're sending them to places like maryland which is the state which neighbors uh, washington dc uh, this region is expected to become a hot spot at some point. Uh, very intense new measures have been put in place in terms of physical distancing. Uh, you know, grocery stores have, have been, uh, the, the rules around grocery stores have been uh, significantly changed. You know, you have to line up outside, which I know a lot of things are happening uh, in Canada as mm -hmm. well, but you have to wear a mask to go in in the state of uh, Virginia. You have to wear a mask to go in in Maryland, and you have to wait in out outside only a certain number of people are allowed in. So there's some pretty intense social distancing measures here uh, in the United States as they, they anticipate different pockets and different surges.
Yeah, it does. It does seem as though that is, according to public health officials, the, the thing that makes the biggest difference. Um, obviously, the other part of the pandemic is coping with the economy, and when the U.S. economy starts to tank, uh, that has an effect on everyone, partic particularly its neighbor. What is the president saying these days about getting people back to work? Because it does seem as though his goal for that changes uh, pretty regularly. Donald Trump has repeatedly said he wants to get people back to work as quickly as possible, and he's changed his tone on, on the level of urgency of that. Obviously, the American economy was absolutely soaring before uh, any of this uh, pandemic uh, arrived in the United States. And um, Donald Trump really wants to get back to that. It's an election year. He wants to get the country uh, back up and running, and, and that's a big priority for him. But uh, he has been listening to his public health officials, Dr. Deborah Birx, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who have said the virus itself is going to set the timeline on this. No one's going to want to go out to work if there is that risk there. But Donald Trump at his news conference yesterday admitted, you know, if he moves too soon, he acknowledges it could increase the number mm -hmm. of deaths in the United States. So on Tuesday, he's going to be announcing a new task force that is going to be focused on how to open up the American economy, how to do that responsibly. Um, he's also said this is going to be the biggest decision he's ever made in his life as to when and how they go about doing this. Um, so it's 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 certainly something that the president is focused on. The national uh, physical distancing guidelines, the voluntary guidelines that are in place right now, they expire at the end of the month. Um, and the big question is, is the president going to extend those, those guidelines? Uh, and as he said, he's describing it as the biggest decision he'll ever make in his life. Okay. Katie Simpson from Washington reporting from her house today. Thank you, Katie. Good to see you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, a couple of things that Katie said there resonate in this country as well. First of all, on the shipping of equipment uh, within countries to help areas that have been hit more critically. Uh, just two days ago, maybe, Alberta said uh, that it would ship some ventilators, I think 40 ventilators, to Ontario because Ontario has far more cases uh, than Alberta. And Alberta is seeing some success in containing the virus. Um, and Doug Ford said that was, you know, more than welcome. There is an agreement amongst uh, premiers and the federal government as well that equipment can be shared or sent to different regions where there are hot spots within this country. As you saw there, the U.S. now above half a million cases of COVID-19. Just to bring you up to date on the situation in this country, um, we are now at more than 22,000 cases, at least 569 deaths. Important to remember here, of course, that this is not all the cases of COVID-19 in this country because testing right now is fairly limited to uh, frontline workers, people who are showing symptoms, people who have returned from travel in most cases. Um, but more than a quarter of the cases listed are now resolved. So uh, while people are dying, and many people are dying, particularly in long-term care centers, there are people also getting better. And that's important to remember. As we heard from Dr. Tam, we don't know where we are in the peak of this yet, uh, but there is some ways to go still. And then the other part of this that I want to talk about with Catherine Cullen as we wait for federal officials is this idea of when restrictions can be lifted, uh, Catherine. And I wanted to particularly talk about Quebec uh, because we have heard various things from Quebec about the notion that they could reopen school as early as the beginning of May. Uh, and that, that strikes me as very optimistic. Um, uh, and I know that the, the Premier tweeted a little bit about that last night, too. It did seem to be, uh, I would say, per perhaps uh, defending or at least clarifying yeah. his position when he tweeted last night, saying, um, you know, any dis decision we make about coming back to school will happen in consultation with public health authorities. We're not going to predetermine the outcome of those discussions. And this is, of course, because the premier said yesterday um, that there is still a possibility in Quebec of uh, getting students back to school in some fashion uh, in the spring, even in May. And that may strike Can many Canadians as as a surprise given the state of the outbreak in Quebec, of course, uh, has, I haven't looked at the numbers, you know, just recently, but uh, the, Canada's worst hit province, certainly a significant portion of the national cases. And we were talking just a bit earlier, Rosemary, too, about some particularly troubling uh, cases, one in one in particular uh, involving the state of the long-term care facilities there. So uh, that discussion, I think, will be an ongoing one. It will be interesting to see if uh, our officials get asked about that today, because the tone from Ottawa has been, I would say, more cautious than 
than that. Yeah, of course, the idea of when to lift the restrictions, obviously something that governments need to consider and public health officials, because uh, as Dr. Tam has said many times, we're looking at regional epidemics um, across this country. So every region has sort of is at a different place uh, in the fight against COVID-19. So things may happen at different times. OK, Catherine, uh, we'll talk to you after this. Let's go now, though, to the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, here in Ottawa. This is a really special time of year for many Canadians with the Easter weekend having begun and Vaisakhi on Monday. We all need to stay strong and continue practicing physical distancing. That's how we can take care of ourselves, our family, our friends, our neighbors, and our whole country. This year's celebrations will feel very different. I know my family tomorrow will be celebrating together on Zoom but it is crucial for us to continue to follow these rules. I know that this is a special time of year for many, many Canadians. Easter just started and Vesahi is around the corner. However, Canadians must continue to practice physical distancing, stay strong and stay at home. This year, our celebrations will be very different, but it is essential that we continue to follow the rules. By doing so, we can protect our loved ones and our neighbors. Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, le Dr. Howard New, the leader du gouvernement à la Chambre des communes, Pablo Rodriguez, and the Minister government of leader in the House of Commons, Pablo Rodriguez. Dr. Tam, please. Bonjour, hello everyone. I'll begin with our usual update on the number of COVID-19 cases in Canada. There are now 22,559 cases, including 600 deaths. And again, these numbers um, change rapidly over the day, as uh, provinces report. For the lab testing, we've completed tests for over 400,000 people, with now over 5% confirmed positive, as Canada continues to improve our testing to track where the disease is spreading. Yesterday, I mentioned that many of the deaths that have occurred in Canada have been linked to long-term care home outbreaks. While we all need to stay physically away to protect our loved ones in these high-risk settings, we'll need to find new ways to connect and support, check to see what options are in place to get regular updates, to volunteer to help from the outside or donate supports, supplies or virtual entertainment that can help in staying connected. I read a quote recently from Mark Hill, the elected chief of the Six Nations Grand River Reserve in southwestern Ontario. The community is grieving the loss of one of their members who died of COVID-19 and his words resonate for all of us. When all this is over, we will hold each other close. But right now, we need to show unimaginable strength and do everything in our power to ensure we do not lose any more lives. To save lives, families, communities and businesses across Canada have shifted their behaviours to help break the chains of transmission of COVID-19. It is amazing to see grocery stores with tapes on the floor marking the two metre space at which people must stay apart. Schools are using technology to connect with their students via virtual classrooms. This long we can keep doing the things we need to crush the epidemic curve, stay home and find ways to connect virtually, such as playing a board game with family over cyberspace. Take up our core, hashtag staycation for the nation and crush that curve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tam. And maintenant, je donne la parole à Dr. Nou. Dr. Nou, s'il vous plaît. Now we will hear from Bonjour. Dr. Nou. Dr. Nou. Hello. COVID au Canada. I will begin with an update on, on the number of COVID-19 cases in Canada. There are now 22,559 cases of COVID-19 in Canada, including 600 deaths. As for lab testing, we have completed tests for over 400,000 people. Now, over 5% have been confirmed positive. Canada continues to improve testing to track where the disease is spreading. 
Yesterday, we mentioned that many of the deaths that have occurred in Canada have been linked to long-term care home outbreaks. While we all need to stay physically away to protect our loved ones in these very high-risk settings, we'll need to find new ways to connect and support. Let's find out what options are available to get regular updates, to volunteer to help from the outside, or donate supports, supplies, or virtual entertainment that can help in staying connected. Mark Hill, elected chief of the Six Nations Grand River Reserve in southwestern Ontario, recently lost a member of his community. He said yesterday, when this is all over, we will hold each other close, but right now we need to show unimaginable strength and do everything in our power to ensure that we do not lose any more lives. To save lives, families, communities and businesses across Canada have shifted their behaviours to help break the chains of transmission of COVID-19. It is amazing to see grocery stores with tape on the floors marking the two-metre space at which people must stay apart. Schools are using technology to connect with their students via virtual classrooms. This long weekend, let's keep doing what we need to do to crush the epidemic curve. Stay home and find ways to stay in touch virtually. For example, play a board game with family members online. Take up our call, hashtag staycation for the nation. Let's crush that curve. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. New. And now we will hear from Pablo Rodriguez, government leader in the House. Thank you, Christian. And the needs of Kenyans have been changing by the day, sometimes by the hour. Our government has responded by developing an action plan and legislation that matches those needs. We have come forward with a plan for a wage subsidy to keep workers connected to their jobs. And today, the House has been recalled so that MPs can consider and pass this important legislation. Earlier this week, on Monday, I sent draft legislation of the wage subsidy bill to opposition parties. This is a testament to how important collaboration is for us, collaboration and teamwork. We have all been in talks throughout the week. Each party has views on the best ways to protect Canadians. But we all agree on one thing. Acting now is essential. We must support Canadians, and we will support Canadians. Together in the best interests of Canadians. It happens two weeks ago when Parliament met to pass legislation to help Canadians affected by COVID-19, and this will be done again today. All parties in the House agree on the wage subsidy bill, and this shows the success of collaboration. And I want to be clear. As we move forward during the COVID-19 crisis, our government is firmly committed to a parliamentary accountability. Et à l'heure actuelle, les comités sur la santé et les finances tiennent leur réunion régulière par téléconférence. The Health and Finance Committees are meeting regularly via teleconference, and this allows committees to hold the government accountable for its decisions throughout the COVID-19 situation. I also wrote to the House Speaker to ask him to look into ways that we can innovate and hold House of Commons deliberations in new and different ways, which might include virtual sessions. The Speaker of the House of Commons got back to me very quickly, saying that his team had started to look into different options. This is very promising. There are some promising avenues. And I welcome my colleagues from opposition parties to join us in this ongoing reflection. The House of Commons has a crucial role to play throughout this crisis. For their collaboration. These are trying times for Kenyans. They're looking to their parliamentarians to work as Team Canada and to do the right things. And we're all committed to doing that. We will work on this together and we will get through this together. On est déterminé à y arriver. On y travaille ensemble. We are determined. We are working as a team, and we will get through this together. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Bill, please. 
Well, good morning. Thanks, Christia, and thanks to all of you for being here this morning. And like Christia, I'd like to wish everybody who's celebrating, either with their families in person or virtually, a, a happy holiday weekend. I'm very glad that we've been able to reconvene Parliament today in order to pass this emergency legislation. Canadians have come together in extraordinary ways to save lives and to stop the spread of COVID-19. But as you know, this has a very real impact on our economy. From the start, we've been clear that our approach is firmly focused on people. We've been listening to Canadian workers and businesses throughout this crisis. I've been on the phone, like many of my colleagues, for hours each day, hearing directly from business leaders, union leaders, and uh, interested Canadians about how to make sure that our programs are helping Canadians to get through this pandemic. We want to make sure that these programs are simple and easy to use, flexible to the needs of as many Canadians as possible. We're doing this so that we can make sure we're getting Canadians the help that they need. That includes helping the business owners who create jobs and provide the goods and services that we all rely on. Dès le début, nous avons clairement indiqué que notre approche était résolument axée sur Since the start, our approach has been firmly focused on people. We have been listening to business leaders and Canadians throughout this crisis. Every day, I spend many hours on the phone. I speak with my colleagues, business leaders and union leaders. I have conversations because we all want to ensure that our programs work well. We want our programs to be simple, easy to use, and flexible to meet the needs of as many Canadians as possible. This approach will enable us to deliver the help that Canadians need. ...which is proposing to support employers who have been significantly impacted by COVID-19 with a wage subsidy of 75 per cent. Businesses, nonprofits, and charities they're all able to apply for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy if they've seen a 15% reduction in revenues this March or 30% reduction in revenues in April or May. Businesses can do this by comparing their revenues to the same month last year or the average revenues of January and February of this year. And nonprofits and charities will have the option of whether or not to include government contributions when making their calculations. The wage subsidy will provide up to $847 a week per employee for up to 12 weeks. This, employer, this support should help employers to keep their employees and in many cases to rehire them. Aujourd'hui, je déposerai... Today, I will table Bill C-14, a bill to support employers who have been impacted by COVID-19. It is a 75 percent wage subsidy bill. This will help businesses, nonprofits, and charities. They will be able to apply for the wage subsidy if they have seen a 15 percent revenue loss this March or a 30 percent revenue loss this April or May. Businesses will be able to use as a reference period the same month last year or January or February of this year. Nonprofits and charities will be able to include or not include government contributions in their calculations for application. Employers will be able to receive up to $847 per week per employee for up to 12 weeks. We want to ensure that employers can keep their employees on the payroll or rehire employees. Like families, owners and employees work together for decades, sharing in successes, supporting their families and supporting communities across our country. In this time of deep uncertainty, this program will provide families with assurances that paychecks are coming in. Now is the time for everyone to work together and to come together. I'm calling on all parliamentarians to pass this bill swiftly so that Canadians get the support that they need urgently. En cette période d'incertitude profonde,
During these very uncertain times, our government is providing assurances that checks are on the way. I call on all parliamentarians to quickly adopt this bill so that all Canadians receive the help that they need and quickly. Those Canadians that are making sacrifices to stay home and save lives know that we have their backs during this time, that they'll be able to feed their families and to keep a roof over their heads. There really can be no further delay. Canadians are counting on us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bill. And we're now ready to answer your questions. Okay. As usual, we'll start with three questions on the phone. One question, one follow-up, and then we'll turn to the room. Operator. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile un maintenant pour poser une question. Our first question, notre première question, vient de Philippe Vincent Foisy avec Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Philippe Vincent Foisy, Radio Canada. Go ahead. Question. Hello, everyone. My first question is for Ministers Morneau and Rodriguez. Minister Morneau, when will the wage subsidy be paid out? We've heard three weeks, six weeks. Do you have any more information regarding dates? And Minister Rodriguez, What's in the bill you'll be tabling today? What concessions have you made? Answer, Minister Morneau. Thank you for your question. The wage subsidy is urgent. We need to send out checks to businesses as soon as possible to help businesses and their employees. Thanks to the bill we will be tabling today, businesses will also be able to receive support from banks. And we said last week that it might take three to six weeks for the wage subsidy. Now we're saying two to five weeks, but we hope it will be even quicker if possible. We are working tirelessly every single day. We're working hard to see just how soon we can get the money out. But I'd like to assure everyone that the wage subsidy will be paid out in the next few weeks. We know how urgent it is to get funds to businesses so that they can be paying their employees. It's, reason, it's the reason why this legislation is so urgent. Uh, we know that with this legislation, banks will be able, uh, employers will be able to go to their banks to get funding. Uh, we also know that this allows us to move forward in getting the funds out rapidly. A week ago, we said this would take three to six weeks. Obviously, now that's two to five weeks, and we're aspiring to do that as rapidly as possible. I'm assured that we will be closer to the short end of that time, but we'll, we'll work every day to make sure that money gets out to employers and therefore to employees. Minister Rodriguez speaking. This is not about concessions. This is about teamwork. Our government is tabling a very good bill, and all parties support the bill. We have been in talks all week. We have been finding ways to continue to work together. For example, we will be increasing the number of committees that will sit during this time. Industry committee, government operations, and the Ways and Means Committee as well. And that committee will be tasked primarily with studying different ways that we can meet virtually. That committee will look into what other countries are doing, for instance, in England. They will look into ways that members can continue to meet in this context of a pandemic. And if the committee determines that meeting virtually is the best way, then that's how we'll proceed. Follow-up question, Philippe Vincent Foisy. Where are the negotiations at at this point? April 20th will be the deadline to suspend the House. So do you have any idea what will happen after April? Also, Dr. New, in your opinion, from a health standpoint, is it safe to have members physically sitting in the House? Minister Rodriguez, answer. We are in constant communication with our colleagues and other parties. We are recalling the House. Some 
Members wanted to recall the House for several days of sitting. But when we sit, it's not just the members that we have to take into account. There are security agents, technicians, interpreters, political staff, those who clean the chamber. And we must consider all of these people in our deliberations. Dr. New, from a health standpoint, I'd like to repeat what we've said a, sal a thousand times. The most important thing is to keep two meters apart and practice physical distancing. That is the best way to stay safe. We must ensure that physical distancing is upheld. And furthermore, a lot of cleaning and sanitizing is crucial as well. Thank you. Merci. Thank you for the question. Next question. Michel Lamarche, TVA Nouvelle. Question. Hello. I have a question for Minister Rodriguez. Quebec made a suggestion yesterday. They raised the possibility of reopening schools and daycares as soon as May 4th. What is your opinion on that, especially given that Prime Minister Trudeau said we would return to normal life very progressively? Answer, Minister Rodriguez, it's not up to me to opine on decisions made by the government of Quebec. Maybe my colleagues might like to weigh in. Minister Freeland, let's have a Dr. New answer from a health perspective. Dr. New. The epidemiology and the curve uh, is different in every region and even in different municipalities. The government of Quebec is keeping a very close eye on the situation in Quebec in each of its regions. And in Ottawa, we within the federal government are always studying best practices and evidence-based studies which inform our decision-making. And all decision-making must be cautious and judicious. Follow-up question, TVA Nouvelle. I have a question about long-term care facilities, especially for senior citizens. This crisis has been evolving for weeks now. Seniors are a very vulnerable group in Canada. Is it time for the federal government to step in and help provinces to better help senior citizens? Answer, Dr. New. Thank you for the question. The federal government and the Public Health Agency of Canada are playing a leadership role. We have a special advisory committee on which we sit as well as our provincial and territorial counterparts, and we are constantly following all developments. Seniors and long-term care facilities are absolutely a priority. In fact, in our advisory group, we just discussed best practices and guidelines for this population. We at the federal government are responsible for giving best practices and guidelines to the provinces and territories. Then, provinces and territories, and even municipalities, put these guidelines into action based on their individual situations. Thank you, Doctor. Next question. Thank you. Merci. Our next question, notre prochaine question, is from Mélanie Marquis, avec La Presse. Next question, Mélanie Marquis, La Presse. Go ahead. 
Question. I have a question for whoever might like to answer, maybe Minister Freeland or Minister Rodriguez. This morning, we heard that 159 temporary foreign workers from Mexico have arrived in Canada and were not tested for COVID-19. And there have been calls for the federal government to step in and, and not leave everything up to the private sector or to industry. What are your thoughts? Minister Freeland, answer. Thank you for your question. Our farmers and workers in the agri-food industry have made it very clear that temporary foreign workers are essential for food production and food security in Canada. And we must ensure continued food security in Canada, especially in the current context. I would like to emphasize that all temporary foreign workers are subject to the Federal Quarantine Act, as are all incoming travelers to Canada. Yesterday, the RCMP made an announcement. They announced that they will work closely with all local police groups, including the Sûreté du Québec, Quebec uh, Provincial Police. They will work closely with police groups to enforce the Federal Quarantine Act. And I'd like to emphasize that the Federal Quarantine Act does absolutely apply to temporary foreign workers. That's essential. Follow-up question. Okay, so the temporary foreign workers, once they arrive at a Canadian airport, once they land, are they tested for COVID-19? Are they checked for symptoms? Answer, Minister Freeland. All incoming travelers who arrive in Canada are checked for symptoms. If a traveler returns and has symptoms, that individual is immediately quarantined. But everyone who returns to the country, who enters the country, must self-isolate for 14 days, whether or not they have symptoms. In the past few days, we've had some conversations with the provinces, as well as with the RCMP. The RCMP has already begun to cooperate and collaborate with local police forces in order to ensure that the Quarantine Act is enforced. When it comes to temporary foreign workers, uh, Canadians know uh, from our farmers uh, that their work is important to ensure food security, and this season uh, is an essential moment uh, for farmers uh, to begin their work. Temporary foreign workers, like all people, Canadian and non-Canadian alike, entering Canada from another country, are subject to mandatory 14-day quarantine. The RCMP has announced, announced yesterday, that the RCMP, working with local police forces, would be assisting public health in ensuring that those quarantine measures, which are obligatory, are fully enforced. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. We'll now turn to the room. Rachel. Uh, Rachel Haynes from CTV National News. My questions uh, are for Minister Freeland and uh, Dr. Tam, um, and perhaps Dr. New as well. But um, you've just been saying, in response to my colleague's question about long-term care homes, that you will be issuing guidelines to long-term care homes. But um, today we're hearing some reports of long-term care homes where staff have walked out in Markham. Uh, the Montreal Gazette published a report that described some very dire conditions of long-term care homes in Montreal in Dorval. So, are these guidelines going to be enough? What is the role right now for the federal government to do more to make sure that people at home know that their loved ones who are in care homes are being taken care of? 
I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Tam, who's been working a lot on this. Um, the situation in long-term care homes is very, very concerning. Um, and uh, it's maybe particularly concerning in this holiday weekend when a lot of us can't see um, our parents or grandparents uh, who are in long-term care homes. So the first thing I would say is, although it's really, really hard, it is essential for non-essential people not to enter those long-term care homes. Um, that is a real danger to the people who we love who are there. Uh, we have been working. We. It is absolutely the case that people who are resident in long-term care homes are a particularly vulnerable group of Canadians. And we have been working very closely with the provinces to put in place measures to protect the safety of those people even more. British Columbia has shown real leadership in, for example, banning people from working in more than one long-term care home at a time. Uh, and as you heard from Dr. New, it's something we're very focused on, and we will be coming out with guidelines very soon. Dr. Tam? Yeah, and I, as I've said repeatedly, this is the key uh, at-risk population for this uh, epidemic, this pandemic. So um, the guidance for long-term care uh, homes um, are probably on our website right now, if, if not uh, very soon. It is a um, evidence-informed guidance and is supported by all chief medical officers of health across the country. I do think that the, these recommendations, I'll, I'll name a few, uh, to me might be one of the um, key legacies of this particular pandemic, which is how do we ensure better safety and support for residences and staff and visitors um, in, in these uh, settings. So, for example, some of the key um, recommendations of these guidance, as we just said, includes the fact that uh, volunteers or visitors should be restricted to essential um, work only, uh, essential and uh, in terms of, for example, feeding or uh, for very much some compassionate reasons, but they'll be very uh, limited from that perspective. Given the evidence base on the uh, possibility of transmission from asymptomatic, uh, pre-symptomatic people, for example, staff who might be entering from the outside, even before they know that they could have symptoms or be infected, we are recommending training and monitoring the compliance uh, for uh, infection prevention control measures, which includes wearing a mask for the duration of the shift or the visit. So that is a um, additional measure that we are recommending. And, but that's only one layer of measure. The whole way that long-term care facilities must uh, support social distancing, for example, during meal times, you cannot have people congregating. Um, you cannot um, use, um, you know, common items without cleaning and proper um, disinfecting as needed. Really good screening for any kind of signs and symptoms of um, COVID-19, whether they be visitors, staff or residences. And as uh, Minister Freeland had just said, one of the key recommendations is to identify staff who work in more than one location and prevent this from happening wherever possible. I know there are realities as to how might that, that roll out. I'm really heartened to see not just British Columbia, but many other provinces just in the last day or so announcing some of the stricter measures that they're putting in place to protect uh, residences of those um, um, residences. Um, of those um, facilities. So um, this is the moment to really step up, I think, on everything that we can do to prevent um, the introduction and spread in those facilities. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just go back to Minister Freeland and Dr. Tam on this again. Um, a lot of these guidelines are based off of the fact that people are still going to work and will still be in these facilities to actually follow the guidelines. But that doesn't address the fact that people 
don't want to go into these long-term care homes where there are outbreaks. And it doesn't really address the fact in Dorval where some of these um, people who are living in these homes were left in their diapers for days or not being taken care of properly. How concerned are you about how these guidelines will actually even be able to, to be taken into effect if there's not even the workers there to follow them? Look, um, these are incredibly uh, horrific uh, reports that we've all been seeing, uh, really heart-wrenching situations. Uh, the guidelines that are coming out either right now or very soon are going to be important measures in helping to protect both the people who are in long-term care facilities and also the people who work there. Both groups uh, are entirely deserving of protection, and absolutely everyone in Canada needs to be doing more to protect them. Do you want to add anything, Dr. Tan? Well, you, I think you may have seen some of the provinces coming in to support people who work in these facilities because um, they're not necessarily being paid, for example. Um, so some of the measures, for example, in BC, is to actually support uh, care aides and others who do provide absolutely important functions, but they're not being supported enough to do so. And, for example, the, the recommendation to wherever possible limit work to only a single facility has some reality checks to it. So you do have to put in the supports in place in order for, uh, for people to actually um, um, follow those kind of recommendations. So I think you will see that the provinces are all very seized with this issue. And it's both from a guidance and infection control perspective, but also a support from uh, employment perspective as well. Thank you, Dr. Ashley. Uh, Ashley Burke, CBC News. Um, Deputy Prime Minister, can you tell me what the talks have been like the last couple of days with, with the opposition behind the scenes? And how do you prevent these sort of last minute negotiations um, to pass legislation during this crisis? Um, I'm going to let Pablo, who has really been profoundly engaged in these talks, he may look a little more tired today than usual, uh, answer that. I mean, th these discussions are, are, are normal. We're working uh, as a Team Canada, and that's, that's what we want as a government. We, we table a bill, a very good bill, where uh, there, were, there weren't that many conversations around the bill because it's there, you know, for, for, for all Canadians. Uh, there were some conversations around the sitting of the House, this and that, and, and, but, but the objective here is, 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 is to work together, and this is what we've been doing with, with uh, all the parties throughout the week, and on a regular basis, uh, I have to say. Uh, and we have to see how we can move on, making sure that MPs can do their job, that Parliament um, uh, can do what it has to do, but maybe in different ways. We have to be creative. We are asking Canadians to be creative. We're asking Canadians to, to, to stay home. So that's why I wrote to the Speaker of the House, asking him to explore the possibilities of, of virtual sittings, and he's doing that with his team. Um, I'm asking my colleagues from other parties to, to work with us on this also, see how we can make, you know, make things differently a bit so we can move on together in this in this different period of time and as we do our job. And you mentioned there's some promising options on the table for a virtual par parliament. What specifically are those promising options? And would you say yes to some smaller in-person sittings until that's up and running? We heard today from the opposition it could take up to four weeks. Well, there are sittings actually of committees. We have actually the Committee of Finance and, and the Committee of, of Health are, are meeting virtually. And now we're going to add other committees, uh, for example, uh, industry human resources, uh, government operations, and also uh, PROC, the procedural committee. And this one is tasked with something extremely specific. The PROC committee has to analyze how we can do this differently to take into consideration this pandemic, the fact that, we, you know, on one hand, we can't tell Canadians, stay home because that's the way to fight this, and then come here every day and meet. because. When we come here, it's not only the MPs that come here. It's all the cleaning people, I mean, security people, the technicians, the, the clerks, the, the political staff, interpreters. So it brings a lot of people together. So let's see if there's different ways to do this.
Uh, hi, Mackenzie Gray from CTV News. Mr. Monell, my question's for you. Uh, when the Prime Minister announced change to the wage subsidy, he discussed the idea that uh, there would be supports in there for home care workers who potentially could make more money on the CERB versus actually going into work. I think that ties into my colleague's question earlier about people who work at seniors' homes who think it, I can, well, I might make more money staying at home, it might be similar money to stay at home, but I'll be safer there. Can you outline specifically what will be in the bill today that will uh, encourage home care workers, people who work at seniors' homes or other health care workers to continue to go to work? Well, I think, I think the Prime Minister <clears throat> identified correctly that we need to think about all the Canadians and how we're supporting everyone. So uh, in the wage subsidy bill, clearly what we're doing is we're making sure that employers can keep their employees attached to their, their enterprise, which will allow them to get you know significant source of funds, but also keep that connection with their workforce. The emergency response benefit is allowing those people who, you know, they might not be attached to an employer or they might be laid off to, to continue to be able to get funding for themselves and their families. And we're, we're looking to make sure that we... We help every Canadian who finds themselves in a difficult position because of COVID-19. Uh, that means, uh, as you say, home care workers uh, and essential workers in, in many categories are people we need to look at to make sure that they're continuing to, to work, to be encouraged to work. And there's, there's work that's going on right now that, uh, that is considering this issue. I don't have anything specific to respond to right now, but I will, in the, in the near term, have some things to respond on that front. So there's nothing in the bill today that specifically addresses that issue that the Prime Minister talked about when he announced the changes to this? To be clear, the bill today is the wage subsidy bill. So it's helping uh, literally of the 19 million people who work, you know, roughly 15 million of them, 14 million of them are attached to employers. So it's, it's looking at those employers that have been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, there are other things we need to do. And as you've seen, we've been addressing things on a daily basis as we get through <clears throat> as we get through the challenges that we're, that we're facing. So that continues to be important and we'll have more to say. Thank you, Minister. That's all the time we have for today. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse. Merci. All right, and that is our federal briefing today, starting a little earlier than usual because, of course, the House of Commons is sitting uh, at 12.15 to pass that wage subsidy legislation. Um, I'll bring in my colleague Catherine Cullen shortly. I would say just a, a highlight for, for me in terms of news is that the federal uh, public health officials and provinces have agreed on some uh, guidelines for long-term care facilities after hearing a couple of um, really troubling reports, one out of Montreal uh, and one out of uh, Markham, Ontario. But the one in Montreal particularly disturbing as long uh, as elderly people are being left uh, essentially without the support that they need. And in fact, the Premier of Quebec, who was going to take a day off today, uh, will now be at the daily briefing in Quebec at 1 o'clock Eastern to address some of those concerns at that particular long-term care facility. Speaking of that, and as we wait uh, for the Prime Minister to speak at around 12.15, in the House. Uh, we'll get to Catherine in a moment. Uh, but these long-term care facilities are of particular concern, particularly for the elderly, who are very vulnerable, obviously, uh, in the face of this pandemic. In fact, Dr. Tam suggesting that one of the legacies of the pandemic may be in terms of how we treat people in long-term care facilities. And, and many people, many families now, are faced with an awfully difficult decision of do they leave people uh, their loved ones in those homes, or do they try to take them out and care for them themselves? There have been numerous cases of outbreaks happening in these homes, including the Participation House in Markham, Ontario, which I mentioned earlier, where a, a reportedly staff walked out when they found out that there were a number of positive um, cases in that home. Laura Meffin made the call to pull her daughter Emily out of the residence earlier this week due to an outbreak. Participation House is a facility for adults with disabilities. However, Emily has developed a fever and she may in fact be sick. These are some of the tweets that led us to this story. Laura is now concerned she won't be able to provide the care her daughter needs for long. And uh, Laura and Emily join us now from Markham, Ontario. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Hi, Emily, good to see you both. Um, you say hi. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Uh, Laura, what, how, how did you, I guess, tell me how you got here. You, you decided that there was no choice for you but to, to, to pull Emily out. Yeah, so on Tuesday, we um, got notification that there was a possible outbreak 
um, with a cough, a fever, and a runny nose. So we made the decision, our family made the decision to take Emily out of participation house um, so that we could hopefully so she wouldn't get COVID. And if she did, then we could care for her one-on-one. -on -one. And how difficult a decision was that for you? Because I imagine Emily had a, her life is all in, in you know, largely in the house. She's got a routine there. And it means that you have to take on all that care now. Yeah, um, like our house, Emily's been living at Participation House for two years. And the reason why she moved in there was it was getting harder and harder for us to physically take care of her. Uh -huh. um, so it, it was it was a hard decision, but it was also an easy decision. Like we had to do it for Emily and that was just it. Um, but it, we don't have all the um, the equipment and the care sure. for her uh, yeah. right now. I'm isolating upstairs and with Emily by myself. So I'm doing the care one on one for 24 hours. And do you were you working before that? Have you had to take a leave in order to pick up all this uh, additional care for your daughter? No, um, I've always been staying at home with Emily um, okay. just because of the nature of her disease. Um, what I have been doing is a lot of volunteering. I do a lot of volunteering in the community um, at the ta at the city of Markham, at our children's treatment center in our local school as well. So, so you do have some concerns. I guess Emily had a bit of a fever. I don't know if she's displaying any other symptoms. Do, do, what is your what 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 do you think is going on right now in terms of her health? So, when we brought Emily out on Tuesday, she actually had a fever or a low grade fever of 37.5. Um, and with Emily, she rarely ever gets sick. So mm. for her to have a fever, um, even just a slight temperature means that something is going on with her. Um, so she had the fever Tuesday and Wednesday morning. I gave her some Tylenol Wednesday. She fell asleep and woke up and then she was fine. So I was just thinking, oh, it's just a cold. It was just a cold. and. Uh, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, she seemed fine, but then Thursday night in the morning at like 2.30 in the morning, she started um, screaming out with a lot of pain. Yeah. Um, at first, I thought she might be having a seizure. I gave her seizure medication. That didn't stop. Um, I was just so worried. I didn't know what um, I should do, where I should go. Um, and we just kind of wrote it out. And then around 630 in the morning, um, she fell asleep. And then when she woke up, she didn't have a fever and she was fine. Mm -hmm. And then we found out in the morning that Participation House was confirmed with COVID and in talking to Participation House and telling them Emily's um, symptoms, they agreed that Emily most likely does have COVID. So from what I understand, there were about 10 residents there that had COVID and two staff members. What do you know about what happened when staff were informed around that? I, I, did, did people say they didn't want to work there? What, what was the consequence of that? Um, I, I, I don't know the specifics, but what I heard from um, one of the senior staff was that they had the meeting and um, they, they had to tell the staff. And then by the time the end of the meeting, it was um, the, the staff, the other staff just started leaving and just some were in tears, some were in shock. Um, they they just they just all up and left except for I think two um, staff member other than the senior administration team left and I think there was about six to eight staff having to take care of uh, 42 I guess if Emily's out 41 um, residents there and it, like you need two staff staff members to take care of Emily, to lift her and transfer her. So there's, that it, it, you need a lot of staff. Like it, it's just, they were, the ones that were there, one nurse was, she was working over 24 hours and she was exhausted. And then she was starting to make mistakes hmm. and it's, it's not fair on them. Like they were not given enough equipment protection, 
staffing. They were just pretty much left to their own to deal with this crisis with these vulnerable people. And and how is Emily doing now? Or are you just supposed to assume she has COVID-19 and hope it doesn't get worse? Or, or what advice are you being given? Um, I, I'm not give, being given any advice at this point in time. I tried to contact, I contacted telehealth. I have a, um, a scheduled meeting to talk to a nurse at uh, on Sunday, April 12th at 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. So I haven't been able to do that. Public health, I had called and they are on holidays. Um, the doctor at Participation House, I wanted to talk to her. And unfortunately, she will not allow parents to contact her on their own. So I don't have any contact with um, Emily's family physician. So we're in, in no man's land right now. We don't have any help. No one is offering to give us any guidance whatsoever. How, how is Emily doing? Is the fever gone? Any other symptoms or is she doing okay right now? She, she's doing okay. It fluctuates. Yeah. Like right now she doesn't have a fever. And then all of a sudden, like in the afternoon, she seems to be spiking the fever. At night, she seems to get more um, pain. Um, I am trying to do the regimen um, consistently of Tylenol mm -hmm. and I've been crushing the Tylenol and giving it to her. Um, the worst is if like we have to, I have to be with her at night just to make sure she doesn't have a seizure because when she yeah. does get tired or her, her temperature goes up, she is potential for a seizure. So, so uh, I don't know how long you can do this. If you're telling me that normally Emily has two support workers with her, I'm not. I, obviously, you'll do whatever it takes for your daughter. But w what do you need? What do, what do you need the government to hear? Whether it be the provincial government or federal government, in terms of what you need for help here. Um, the first thing would be is to be, have testing. Like I'm just going on the assumption that she has it. Like you know, like so we need testing. But I can't go out and get tested because Emily can't. I like to get her tested. I have to expose my husband and my son to um, to this mm -hmm. in order to her to get her downstairs. Um, and it, even I can't go and get tested because if I do, I can't leave Emily by herself. Right. So we're stuck upstairs here. There's other people, other populations that are in the same boat. Yep. I've also been told that Emily has a, a fever of 37.5. That's not a fever. She won't get tested, even though she's been in, in a long-term care facility that has mm -hmm. confirmed cases of COVID and, and that's that's just not right. The other thing is that we need um, like the long-term care facilities like Participation House, we need to have the PPEs there constantly. Like they're going to get sick. The staff are going to get sick. They're gonna get sick. They're going to spread it to the other vulnerable population because we need, like, you need the face mask because there's going to be saliva. There's going to be germs sending right into your face. And a mask, like a face mask over the mouth, mm -hmm. is not going to cut it. It's just not yeah. going to do that. I should say Public Health Ontario says they are not on holiday today, so there should be someone there, and hopefully they're watching and someone can reach out so you don't have to wait until tomorrow. Um, listen, keep, keep us up to date. Yeah. I know these are very trying times, and particularly with this decision that you've made, um, which, which makes it even more challenging. Okay. I, I just wanted to say yes. um, Jane Philpot has reached out, and, and someone um, is going to help us with the testing. Okay, that's good to hear. Uh, Jane Philpott, of course, the former health minister yeah. who's returned uh, to do some work as, as a doctor because she is a trained doctor. Laura, thank you so much. I, I do appreciate it. It's really important uh, part of, of all of this and we appreciate you making the time for it. And Emily, thank you. Bye. You appreciate it, Emily. Bye. 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 Thank you <laughs> so much. Thanks for being so patient. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Laura and okay. Emily. Take, take good care, all right? We're wishing for the best for you. Bye. Bye-bye.
All right. Uh, as we wait for the House of Commons to get underway here, it will be sort of the regular uh, procedural and, and pomp and circumstance you see around that with the Speaker's Parade. Um, but of course, a very limited number of MPs inside the House to debate the wage subsidy uh, legislation, which now it appears everyone has agreed on, uh, all the parties have agreed on. Before I get to Catherine Cullen to help us through that coverage, just want to bring in uh, one small business owner. Uh, his name is Joel Wiggins, uh, Wiggers, sorry, and he is a tattoo artist and works out of his shop in Nanaimo, British Columbia. Hello, how are you? Hi, Rosemary. I'm great. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> I am good. So you, uh, good. I guess you're not doing any work right now. That's just impossible. Tell me what your situation is. It is. Yeah, we had that government uh, order to close uh, a few weeks ago, and so obviously we complied. I uh, try to keep everybody safe. Um, so as of right now, yeah, there's zero work going on. I do miss my shop, but uh, there are challenges associated with that as well. So, yeah. And you, do you have employees or are you the only employee? I am uh, my only employee. I do have two understudies or apprentices that are working with me, um, but I am a micro business. I, uh, I'm a very busy tattoo artist. I'm happy to say that I'm booking into 2023, but right now it's, uh, it's a dead you know, a standstill, but I am my only, only employee, yeah. So what does that mean then for you? I, a wage subsidy obviously isn't gonna work because you don't have employees. What, what kind of aid are you looking for or are you able to get from your understanding? Um, I've been looking into all sorts. Um, I've applied for the CERB, CEBA, um, also uh, at, uh, I think it's the BCTRS, uh, a rent subsidy. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I've uh, BDC, I've applied for a loan with the BDC. I've also applied, as I said, for the CEBA, which is a, a, an emergency business account loan, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, so for me, the, the idea of a, um, a subsidy or a uh, wage subsidy yeah, it doesn't apply to me. So I feel like there could be a possibility of being kind of fallen through the crack a little mm -hmm. bit on that one mm -hmm. uh, as a micro business. And um, I, I just want to point out that with the government, and I do appreciate everything that they are doing. I think the government is doing a great job of truly, really trying to help people. But I just want to caution that, you know, they don't forget about the very small guy um, sure. that has to somehow survive. And I feel like after this is all over, um, many, many little businesses that are, you know, like massage therapists, hairdressers yeah. and, and the like, artists, musicians, um, they're the ones that are going to be really feeling this after the fact because there isn't necessarily the help because we're not a big beacon of light in the, in the sure. context of what Air Canada is and so forth, right? So, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, initially it was it was only for small and medium businesses and then they grew it because they they realized that they needed to cover more people. So the small, mm -hmm. the small, the, the business loan part of it, the $40,000 you could get access to maybe if mm -hmm. you qualify, would that be enough for you to keep uh, paying the rent and, and just make sure the business is there in a few months or is that not even gonna be enough? Uh, that would get me through, uh, I, I figure, about five to six months of just kind of having a survival fund to just make sure that when I go back to work that my business is still there. Yeah. I've spent a lot of money, a lot of effort. I'm, I'm a bit OCD. I love my business. I've put a lot of money and effort into making it a very clinical, clean, beautiful spot. And to lose that, um, and beyond that even, Rosemary, is uh, after the aftermath, there's a there's a loan and a, and a debt associated and I, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's sort of a follow burden for me to now really start from ground zero hopefully still having my business but now having that burden of you know that weight to now have to have another loan another uh, debt to try and pay off while not being able to make any money it, it right now so I feel yeah. like it could be a compounding problem where honestly if I could say one thing to our prime minister be like yeah don't forget the small small micro business guy the fiber of our society but also allow us to have a survival um, plan where when we come out the other side, we're not burdened. So make it a grant, not a loan. You know, yeah. I understand that 25% could be forgiven, but you know, even if it's 50-50, if we're in this together, let's be in this together. Let's say, okay, let's make this available for the, for the small business, but let's, let's meet halfway, not here's a nice big debt for you at the end of it all, and yeah. hopefully you can make it back and pay your taxes again. So that's what I'd like to see happen, yeah. Okay. Joel Wiggers, message received, probably, anyway. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you. appreciate you coming on, and uh, good luck to you. Stay healthy and, and well. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, you probably saw in the corner of your screen there these uh, speakers parade uh, as they entered into West Block for the House of Commons. So let's bring back the CBC's Catherine Cullen. Uh, sorry about that, Catherine. I like to get no the guests problem. in when I have a moment. Uh, so uh, we are expecting this to... Uh, do, you have, do we have a sense of how this is going to unfold and, and how quickly this might happen at this stage? Uh, uh, relatively quickly, uh, I will say, uh, over the course of perhaps an hour or two, a little bit longer. Uh, we're still waiting to get the specific 
specifics, frankly, from government house leader Pablo Rodriguez. In fact, I think we might get some details right now. Yeah, I think the House Speaker, Anthony Rota, is speaking. I'll come back to you, Catherine. Thank you for that. Here, uh, here is the Speaker of the House of Commons. To see the application of Standing Order 17 suspended for the current sitting to allow members to practice physical distancing, I encourage all members to follow this and other recommended best practices during today's proceedings. Therefore, members to speak desiring to speak and address the chair may do so from any seat in the House. De plus, in addition, we will suspend the sitting every 45 minutes for one minute in order to allow employees who provide support for the sitting to substitute each other safely. En toute sécurité. Finally, I ask that all members tabling a document or moving a motion sign the document and bring it to the table themselves. I wish to inform the House that pursuant to Standing Order 28.3, I sent a notice calling the House to meet this day and on Thursday, April 9th, 2020, I sent each member a message explaining the reasons for this recall. I now lay on the table the notice calling the House to meet. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we're gathered here today in a time of great concern and uncertainty about the COVID-19 pandemic. This is something we have never been through before. Delivering a clear and unified message to Canadians. We will not let you down. We will not forget you. We will support you in this time of crisis. So, Mr. Speaker, I believe, if you seek it, that you will find unanimous consent for the following motion. That, notwithstanding any standing order, special order, or usual practice of the House, A, the application of Standing Orders 15, 17, and 56.1 be suspended for the current sitting. B. B. The government responses to petitions 431-00046 to 431-00123 be tabled immediately, and that those to questions on the order paper numbered Q-260 to Q-308 and Q-310 to Q-368 be made into orders for returns, and that the said returns be tabled immediately. C. C. Tuesday, March 24, 2020, and this day shall not be considered as sitting days for the purposes of Standing Orders 34-1, 37-3, 51 and 110, and subsection 2812 of the Conflict of Interest Code for members of the House of Commons. D. Okay, this is uh, the Liberal House Leader Pablo Rodriguez going through a lot of parliamentary procedural talk, which which is important, but uh, in many ways also incomprehensible to uh, to the rest of us uh, and to, to Canadians who, who don't love it um, and follow it along very well. Essentially, what, what Mr. Rodriguez is doing here is uh, laying out how uh, this is going to unfold uh, today and over the next few hours. You can see uh, inside the House, of course, very few members uh, are there uh, in the West Block, and the ones that are there, uh, for instance, the, the, the two MPs over Mr. Rodriguez's left shoulder, uh, one from Ottawa and one from Montreal, are people who uh, were able to drive in to participate um, in what is about to happen here in the House. And I did see the Prime Minister to the left of Mr. Rodriguez as well. This will be his first time back in the House uh, in, in many weeks, uh, because, of course, the House hasn't been sitting, but also because he was self-isolating. Uh, I'll just bring in Catherine Cullen to uh, help us just get into the coverage a bit. Th this is obviously a um, very heavy procedure, Catherine, not even things that I will pretend to understand every moment of, but the, the thrust of what is going to happen here today, and we are expecting to hear from the Prime Minister momentarily, is, is that the wage subsidy legislation will become law by the end of the day, and businesses will be able to start tapping into that. 
That's right. Essentially what's happening right now is they're saying, let's suspend the rules as we normally know them. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently because obviously these are extraordinary circumstances. Um, some of the key pieces of information that we've gleaned so far this morning, Rosemary, I think uh, the thing that a lot of Canadians are going to care about if indeed this is money that they are relying on in order to pay their bills is what we heard from Finance Minister Bill Morneau during the news conference a little bit earlier. He said uh, at this point we're talking about somewhere between two to five weeks before that money goes out the door and that they really are eyeing the, the shorter end of that. They're hoping they can do this sooner rather than later. There's also something very interesting I think happening here from a political perspective. I mean you just heard Pablo Rodriguez talk about the importance of working together. Really that's something we're hearing from all the political parties. There's, I think, uh, a, a very heightened sense of awareness that they're not particularly, the Canadians are not particularly interested um, in any suggestion that there are political games being played right now, that there's any sort of partisanship. At the same time, um, particularly the opposition parties, I think, are interested in showing Canadians their relevance in all of this, how they are contributing to this discussion, the improvements that they've suggested uh, to this piece of legislation, the improvements that the government has accepted, and things that they still think that the government should be doing. The government trying to show that it wants to work together, um, but that it's also respecting the importance of Parliament in all of this, right? That there is a sort of a healthy discussion about how to make sure that these measures um, up, uh, uh, apply to as many Canadians as possible, are helpful to as many Canadians as possible, that that money gets out the door as quickly as possible. Yeah, and, and one of the concessions, although Mr. Rodriguez didn't want to call it that at the press conference, but one of the, the, the compromises that the government agreed to in a bid to allow for more accountability at a time when Parliament is still suspended is that three additional parliamentary committees will be stood up to, uh, to work virtually beyond the Health Committee, which has had a couple meetings and the Finance Committee. And that, that will help as well. Uh, I know parliamentary committees is not something everybody is glued to, but that's where a lot of uh, deep scrutiny of, of uh, legislation and government decisions happens. Um, and so if there are now going to be as many as five parliamentary committees watching and looking at what measures are being taken, that will certainly address some of those concerns around accountability. I, I'll just give people a sense of what will happen after this. Um, all the leaders will be given a chance to speak and we'll hopefully bring that all to you of course starting with the Prime Minister uh, the leader of the official opposition uh, Yves-François Blanchet the leader of the Bloc Québécois Jagmeet Singh the leader of the NDP and Elizabeth May um, the in the, the parliamentary leader of the Green Party for now, she also has come in from the West Coast to be here today. So um, we'll hear more about uh, not only the bill, but also some of the concerns that any of the opposition parties have around, um, you know, what is what is maybe not being done, what things the government could do better. Um, then they should move into what is called a Committee of the Whole, which means that Essentially, the House of Commons, the floor of the House of Commons becomes a committee uh, and there will be rounds of questions. We probably won't cover that uh, live throughout the day, uh, but we will, of course, continue to monitor it. Um, I, Catherine, I just wanted to maybe touch, as we listen uh, and wait for the Prime Minister to speak, touch base on the issue of temporary foreign workers, because yes. Christian Freeland, I thought, gave a much clearer uh, understanding of what is happening there after the bloc leader raised some concerns about it this morning. Yeah, and a response, uh, the word that came to mind as she was describing that, Rosemary, was a French word, musclé, a little bit more of a, a muscular response, let's say, from the uh, from the federal government. They are saying uh, anybody who comes into the country, regardless of whether you're a Canadian or a temporary foreign worker, yes, you have to uh, self-quarantine, uh, self-isolate for 14 days. That's a requirement now. And she talked about the fact um, that police forces are now getting involved, the RCMP, mm -hmm. local police forces, in ensuring that this takes place. She said anybody who is uh, comes in and is symptomatic will, of course, uh, immediately have to quarantine, but everyone is expected to self-isolate. The federal government is trying to strike a bit of a balance here, Rosemary. Um, they know that these agricultural, agricultural workers are uh, essential, crucial in many cases to getting Canada's food supply into the grocery stores, into the places where Canadians can access them, but they also know that there's significant concern about the transmission of COVID-19 from anybody who might be coming from out of country. So trying to strike that balance today. Uh, Minister Freeland talking about the importance of those agricultural workers, but also the importance of the rules being respected. And, and then the other story that we will uh, continue to monitor as, as well as, of course, this critical piece of legislation is uh, what's happening in 
long-term care centers. And of course, I had uh, Laura and Emily on earlier uh, from Participation uh, House in Markham, Ontario, where they are coping with cases of COVID-19. And, and so Laura pulled her, her daughter out to make sure that she was safe. Uh, but the, the focus is also, and more particularly perhaps, on long-term care centers with uh, older Canadians uh, inside, and um, particularly this case in Quebec, which uh, we are expecting the Quebec Premier, who was going to take the day off, François Legault, to show up at a press conference at 1 Eastern to talk about that case, which is fairly uh, horrifying, Catherine. I, I, I think that's probably the way to qualify it, but that also came up in the press conference. Yes, and in fact, we heard uh, Minister Freeland herself say that the conditions are, are horrific. Uh, we have covered it here at the CBC. Uh, CBC Sarah Leavitt had a, an excellent piece on this last night on The National, but it, it first came to light, I believe, through reporting from the Montreal Gazette, and I referenced that report specifically um, because of some of the language used in there where someone referred to it as concentration camp like mm -hmm. uh, conditions, which, you know, it frankly nauseates you even just a little bit to, to say. We know that two people have died in this long-term care facility, um, that there are other deaths where they are still looking into the cause, and that uh, by the description of some of the people who have been in contact with people inside or staff workers who have been inside themselves, that people were uh, essentially patients, uh, residents, left to their own devices is the term that was used. Not only were they dehydrated, but that they were left in soiled diapers or sheets for what appears to be at least a day day, if not several days. And so the, the government, the federal government was asked today, should you be taking a stronger role? Do you not need to just step in when we see the seriousness of what's happening in some of these facilities? Do you not need to step in? The response from the federal government is, well, we are uh, taking a leadership role. They put out new guidelines today. We've seen they've just come out 17 pages worth of guidelines that detail all kinds of things, when screening is to be done, best procedures for um, reducing contact through, through uh, uh, all kinds of measures, everything from the cleaning and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, the question is whether or not that goes far enough. We should say in the case of that one, uh, they're called in Quebec the CHSLDs, the, the long-term care facility on the island of Montreal in the suburb of Dorval, that in that case, the local health care authority has taken control of this particular long-term mm -hmm. care facility. Mm -hmm. And all the reports we're getting right now are that uh, conditions have dramatically improved. Uh, but nonetheless, the story is uh, incredibly upsetting and, and everyone wants to know what can be done to prevent more situations like this yeah and of course this is uh, this is not the only instance of this mm -hmm. uh, it's you know it, it started effectively in British Columbia with a, an outbreak in a long-term care center uh, in on the lower mainland of course there's the the tragic situation happening in Bob Cajun where I'm not sure how many deaths we're at now but uh, it's it's a remarkable number of people dying in a small long-term care center um, and so the the idea that better guidelines would be needed um, is something I think that well first of all public provincial public health authorities have all agreed on but for instance one of the changes that they uh, made uh, in BC was to limit um, workers in terms of how many places they could work how many facilities they could go to sometimes uh, long-term care workers in order to make up a complete salary uh, work at multiple locations and of course that would lead to the spread of COVID-19 so BC shut that down completely um, and is only letting people work in one location to try and limit that. Other provinces have done that, but some have not. Um, well, it was interesting to hear Theresa Tam, too, talk yeah. about the challenges with that, Rosemary, because I think part of what all this does is also um, makes us all reflect on what's being asked of the people who work inside these facilities. And Theresa Tam said, you know, if you're going to say that that's what people should do, you do need to think about how to yeah. support them. And my understanding sure. was she meant economic, um, economic supports. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that's right, because they still need to make the same amount of money. Of course, the, the challenge here, uh, as it is in other instances in dealing with the pandemic, is the jurisdictional issues around this. Obviously, health care, um, exercising health care, making decisions around health care is, is a provincial jurisdiction, so the long-term care centers would be as well. Um, all really the, the Public Health Agency of Canada can do and all the federal government could really do in this instance is to provide some guidance, and which is what they've done for now. Um, so that also a story that we are continuing to monitor and as I said the Quebec Premier expecting now to be part of that briefing at one o'clock which gives you an idea I think of how um, serious the situation was in that one um, long-term care center in Montreal and, and how seriously these things have to be dealt with quickly because uh, the other thing Dr. Tam said 
that I also thought was very interesting was because of the fact that this uh, virus obviously, well, obviously mm -hmm. attacks people who have underlying conditions, but the most vulnerable in our society, particularly older Canadians, uh, that one of the legacies of COVID-19 may be to make some substantive changes in terms of how we treat older Canadians um, going forward in, 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 you know, as in these long-term care centers. It can't be just like this. It, this, this. There has to be another way to move forward. And I know so many families are having such a hard time coping with this. Um, the, the Prime Minister, is he had stepped out. He is now back. You can see him there to the left of the Liberal House leader, Pablo Rodriguez. Um, and he is expected to be the first person to speak. Um, let me just dip in to see if uh, Mr. Rodriguez is, is saying something about the bill at all. For the purpose of dealing with the unique circumstances and the time period of the COVID-19 situation and recovery. That's it, Mr. Speaker. Does the Honourable Minister have the unanimous consent of the House to move the motion? Agreed. The House has heard the terms of the motion. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Carried. Pursuant to order made earlier today, the House will now proceed to statements by ministers. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I rise here in this moment, in this House, as our generation faces its greatest challenge yet. We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us of all those Canadians who saw our nation through difficult, tumultuous times in our history. 103 years ago today, young Canadian soldiers found themselves in the trenches in France, thousands of kilometres from home. The next day, they mounted on Hill 145 and took part in the final battle for Vimy Ridge. Today, on the eve of this somber anniversary, we remember their courage and sacrifice. We remember those soldiers who shaped the country we know today. Twenty years later, many would sent to be sent to the front again. On the evening of November 14, 1940, my grandfather, the young MP for Vancouver North, rose in his seat to speak to the war effort, but first thanked all those senior members who allowed him to speak before them because his leave from the RCAF had expired that night and he was to ship out soon. Jimmy Sinclair would spend the next three and a half years in Europe and North Africa, far from his young family, far from his work in this House of Commons and far from his constituents in British Columbia, serving his country in the best way he knew how. He would return to the chamber in early 1944, a mere few months before D-Day, to exhort Canadians to continue with the sacrifices and efforts required to win. This is the year which will decide a rapid victory or a long and protracted war. A year when our fighting men must be given every conceivable aid and support and encouragement by every man, woman and child in Canada, no matter the personal cost. These were trials that shaped our country and more, our citizens. And now, once again, we are being tried. But Mr. Speaker, this is not a war. That doesn't make this fight any less destructive, any less dangerous. But there is no front line marked with barbed wire, no soldiers to be deployed across the ocean, no enemy combatants to defeat. Instead, the front line is everywhere, in our homes, in our hospitals and care centres, in our grocery stores and pharmacies, at our truck stops and gas stations. And the people 
who work in these places are our modern day heroes. Separated from their family, risking their own health, they had to work every day so that we can eat, so that we can heal, so that we can do our part. Because every one of us has a role to play in helping shield our country from the threat it now faces. In hard times, courage and strength are not defined by what we say or do loudly in public, but by the actions we take quietly, in private, like staying home. Even as we stand apart, we stand united in our resolve to do what we must until COVID-19 is defeated. Mr. Speaker, we're here today to enact the emergency wage subsidy. This is the largest Canadian economic policy since World War II. This subsidy will enable Canadians to keep their jobs and get a paycheck during this crisis. That is what we will be voting on this afternoon. This subsidy is based on steps that have already been taken to come to the assistance of Canadians, like loan guarantees to small businesses and the emergency response benefit. Once again, here in the House, we are called upon to support those in need, and I know we will not let them down. Mr. Speaker, as Canada confronts this crisis, we are all called to serve, to fight for and alongside each of our fellow citizens, to fight for someone's mother, for someone's grandfather, for someone's neighbour. Our job as Canadians is to uphold the dignity and sanctity of every single human life, whether they be rich or poor, young or old, ailing or healthy. That is our duty. Without reservation, without pause, we must fight for every inch of ground against this disease. We must be there for one another, as we spare no effort to safeguard our collective future. Over the coming weeks and months, we will face a number of obstacles. We will go through periods of uncertainty. Fear and uncertainty will continue to be a part of our daily lives. And unfortunately, together, we will mourn the loss of loved ones. Even if we take every possible precaution, the situation may get worse before getting better. That is the sad reality our country faces. Our determination to put an end to this virus and our commitment to look out for one another will be put to the test. But I know that we are up to the challenge. Canadians are among the most fortunate people on earth. Despite the challenges we have yet to overcome, despite the wrongs we have yet to right, ours is a country where we look out for one another, where we take care of each other. The generosity of spirit and compassion. This was alive long before this virus reached our shores and it will survive long after it's gone because it is who we are. Monsieur le Président, notre pays... Mr. Speaker, our country is in mourning. Too many families have lost a loved one because of this disease. One of the greatest cruelties of this disease is that it denies us the opportunity to celebrate their lives and grieve among friends and family. On behalf of all Canadians, I want to offer my deepest condolences to those who've lost someone they love to this disease. However, 
this holiday weekend also marks the coming of rebirth and new life. Easter is a time where Christians honor the passion, sacrifice, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and his teachings of compassion, forgiveness, and love. Passover is a time when Jews recall the covenant made by God with the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, and the heroism of Moses, who led his people from bondage to freedom. Vasaki is a time when Sikhs and Hindus celebrate the new year and the spring harvest. And even for those who are not celebrating, Spring is always a time for renewal. These moments remind us that love, courage, and fortitude are the antidote to despair, that there is no challenge we can't overcome together. So let us make a solemn promise to each other this weekend to do just that. Durant ce long weekend. Over the long weekend, let us make a commitment amongst ourselves to do what needs to be done for as long as it takes. And here in the House, let's do our part to fulfill that commitment. Let's take our responsibilities and come to the assistance of those in need. Mr. Speaker, as I stand here today, I think of the young men who died taking Vimy Ridge. I think of the greatest generation who grew up during the Depression and fought through World War II. They showed us how to fight for what we believe in and how to sacrifice for what we hold dear. Today, across this country, the last members of this greatest generation live in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. They're in their small apartments and the homes they built so long ago with their own hands. They are the ones most threatened by this disease. They fought for us all those years ago and today we fight for them. We will show ourselves to be worthy of this magnificent country they built. And for them and for their grandchildren, we will endure, we will persevere, and we will prevail. Merci. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is perhaps very fitting that we are meeting here on this day, Holy Saturday. The day between the sadness of Good Friday, the day Christ suffered and died for our sins, and Easter Sunday, the day he rose and conquered death. For we are clearly in the middle of great hardship and suffering, but we have every reason to look ahead with hope and towards the end of the health crisis we are currently facing. Our hope is founded on the ingenuity and resilience of humanity and strengthened by the examples of previous threats which we have all overcome. Mr. Speaker, the past month has tested Canadians. We've been told to stay at home, away from family and friends. Birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, religious gatherings have looked different this year. We've relied on Skype or FaceTime to stay connected instead of family dinners, church services, or weekend gatherings. Stores and restaurants have been told to close their doors. As a result, almost six million Canadians have lost their jobs. And the businesses that are still open are worried about how they are going to hang on. 
And despite all of our efforts, more than 22,000 Canadians have fallen ill, and unfortunately, over 600 Canadians have died. Our thoughts and prayers are with all of those who have lost a loved one. In the coming days and weeks, our actions will be more important than ever. Now that the government has finally presented its projections, we know what to expect. We must continue to follow public health directives, and we must act together as a nation. On behalf of the official opposition, I want to acknowledge all of the Canadians who are going above and beyond during these unprecedented times. To the nurses, the doctors, the truck drivers, the grocery store workers, cleaners, pharmacists, farmers, and other essential workers, we say thank you. To the parents juggling schoolwork and their own jobs, we say thank you. I've always had respect for the teachers that have influenced my life, Mr. Speaker, but uh, after spending the last few weeks trying to keep my children up to date with their studies, I have a newfound respect and admiration <laughs> for what they do each and every day of the school year. To the churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, gurdwaras, food banks, shelters, and other organizations helping Canadians during these difficult times, we also say thank you. And to the public servants working hard each and every day to make sure that Canadians get the help they urgently need, we say thank you. Canadians have important questions about the situation we are experiencing. Our economy is at a standstill, and even though the government is announcing programs, funds still aren't flowing to Canadians. We have a deficit of $184 billion, and years of discipline will be necessary to get the Canadian economy back on track. New government documents released to the Health Committee also paint a concerning picture. New government documents released to the Health Committee also paint a concerning picture. As one reporter put it, quote, the documents show a government persistently downplaying the threat of coronavirus until it was too late. Other countries like South Korea, Singapore and Taiwan ramped up testing and secured medical equipment early on, which allowed them to flatten the curve quickly, preventing their economies from being completely shut down. We were told for weeks that the risk of COVID-19 to Canadians was low. We now ask why that risk assessment seemed to change overnight. Why did the government wait so long to impose travel restrictions? Why were travelers not originally screened? Why do we have a critical shortage of medical supplies? Why is it taking the government so long to sign contracts with companies that are offering to retool their facilities to provide much needed medical equipment? Why are other countries further ahead of us when it comes to testing and tracing? These are some of the, Canadian, these are some of the questions that Canadians have and they deserve answers. And while we know that mistakes have been made in the past, Conservatives are focused on looking to the future, on how best to get Canada through this crisis keep our citizens healthy and get our economy back on track. The Prime Minister has said that we need to prepare for a second and perhaps a third wave. Canadians want to know how this government is preparing to get ahead of those waves. And this is why the Conservatives are demanding regular opportunities to ask the Prime Minister and the House of Commons questions about all aspects of the government's response to the COVID-19 crisis. We also want to hold weekly parliamentary committee meetings where MPs can move motions, call witnesses and ask ministers and government officials questions. We cannot wait for this pandemic to end to hold our government to account. Parliament has a crucial role to play right now through debate, discussion and regular questions from the opposition. We will obtain better results for Canadians. Parliament has a vital role to play now through debate, 
discussion and regular questions from the opposition, we will get better results for Canadians. Today's emergency legislation is a good example of this. When the government first announced a 10% wage subsidy, Conservatives and small business owners across this country raised concerns. Other countries were offering far more, and it was clear that 10% was just not going to cut it. So we pushed for a significant increase. A few days later, the wage subsidy was raised to 75%. Credit unions weren't originally allowed to deliver the $40,000 emergency interest-free loans. This left many business owners who use credit unions, especially those in rural locations, left in the lurch, making it harder for them to get the support they needed. We called on the government to make changes, and now credit unions can deliver these loans as well. The need to show a 30% revenue decrease to qualify for the wage subsidy meant too many new and seasonal businesses didn't qualify. We raised this concern, and now there is more flexibility. And this week, we rolled up our sleeves and worked with the government to ensure that businesses have the certainty they need to keep their employees on the payroll. Les conservateurs... Conservatives have been part of Team Canada since day one, offering constructive solutions to improve the government's response to this pandemic. Conservatives have been part of Team Canada since day one, offering constructive solutions to improve the government's response to this pandemic. But we know there's still more work to do. Conservatives have proposed meaningful solutions such as rebating the GST to small businesses that have collected it in the last year to provide a much-needed cash injection. We've also suggested using loss of earnings, subscriptions, or orders as a way to ensure that more businesses qualify for this wage subsidy. And we've put forward ideas to help our energy and charitable sectors, like increasing the charitable donation tax credit. New Boulogne. We want the government to begin implementing our solutions so that no Canadians are left behind. This is the job of Team Canada. We are optimistic that the government will listen to the ideas that we are putting forward to the benefit of all Canadians, Mr. Speaker. That will be a truly Team Canada approach. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. The Honourable Member for Berlay Chambly. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to start by paying tribute, respectfully tribute, to all my colleagues here in the House, but also I would like to show compassion first and foremost for seniors. Je ne peux pas m'imaginer le quotidien I can't imagine what the daily life as of a senior is right now in any of the residence models that we have in Quebec, the rest of Canada. They're isolated from their loved ones. They're exposed to a disease that could be mortal without even being able to see their children or grandchildren one last time. Such a situation is endlessly sad. And I'm also thinking about other seniors, those who are not directly exposed to the virus, who are seeing the value of their pension funds dropping, that are still isolated, often in regions that are already somewhat remote. They can't see their families who live elsewhere. I'm thinking about those individuals. That's not the topic, but I also gave recommendations and suggestions to help them as much as we can. But I'm also thinking about the workers who cannot work right now 
au secours desquels nous nous sommes rassemblés and ici aujourd'hui. For whom we are gathered here today to help. I'm thinking jeunes, savez, about young people and for them this is a, supposed to be a joyful time in their lives and they're locked up, up at home. They can't see their téléphone. friends unless they're on their phones with a few exceptions. Et aux parents qui and gérer I'm also thinking about the parents that have to deal with the impatience of their young ones. I'm also thinking about people who theoretically could choose to stay home, but since it's their vocation, they go to work day after day in our health care system. They are exposed to this virus beyond reasonable levels, and they can't keep two or three meters of distance when they're at work. I'm thinking about those who are working in the transportation sector, who are working crazy hours in uncertain conditions, and often they don't even have access to the very basic tools that they need when they're on the road to have a shower or to eat. They do not receive the respect that their job would suggest. I'm thinking about the agricultural workers who are facing particular challenges. I pay tribute to them as well. And I'd like to pay tribute to my colleagues who are working with me and if I, to all those who are part of Team Canada. The recent weeks have shown, and I'd particularly like to show that we can work better by working together. Since the beginning of this situation, Despite people wanting, some people being tempted to mark political points, we have been as open and honest as possible. Today, we are going to adopt legislation, and of course, there will be some people here in the House that when times get better, it will be thanks to them. And I think today, we have to put all that aside. It will be thanks to our, our group together with 380 people chosen by all Canadians and Quebecers, all members of this parliament. Our SMEs that are at the very heart of our economic fabric in Quebec will have a crucial tool now. I'm looking at this from a worker aspect. On one hand, this legislation will protect their purchasing power, in addition to what EI would give them. This will benefit workers, and it will also support our economy because at the very basis of the billions of dollars that the government will be investing in individuals and companies, this is to protect their future future income as well, tax revenues as well. And that's what we have to do. And I'd like to underscore that this is proof that history will never let us forget the crucial and essential role of the state that it plays in our economy, the how legitimate it is for the state to intervene in the economy. Sometimes less state is not better. Families will find security in this legislation, as will workers and parents. Research and science will find us the remedy to this virus. But it is the feeling of security that will fight the anxiety and fears and concerns and about our future. And this is one of the fundamental roles that we are playing. There was cooperation, and we were happy to be, to be a part of it. And I would just like to say that we're going to say we're not going to say that we were behind whatever measure, or we'll be humble in that respect. 
startup companies. Well, the Minister of Finance took them into account. I appreciated that. They were strong growth companies that were particularly at risk, and that was addressed. There were social companies as well that particularly are of interest to me, and they were also part of the program. And I'm happy that there is this component in the legislation, in the motion rather, we were able to ensure that SMEs won't have to pay uh, have revenue that will only be covered by debt when they will have to start back up again. They won't have to pay this back. So the government is establishing a measure that will allow companies to have some support that will not have to be reimbursed later. And this is something uh, that was particularly close to my heart. And I am very grateful to the government for this because they added this to their thought process. And that's how we're going to move forward. I would like to call this vigilant cooperation. Cooperation, I think that Quebecers and Canadians expect of us. They expect us to work together in their best interest. And of course, this is a democracy based on the latest choice of Canadians and Quebecers. We have to keep an eye on things. We have to give it ourselves the tools to do this. And I know this is part of what we're looking at today. So I think there are some good components here, even though, in my opinion, there isn't enough. But let's start looking at this right away. As you know, we are going to defeat this virus like others have and others will after us, probably, if we don't forget science and research in this process. There are research centers that are not qualified right now for various measures, and they will see their personnel go elsewhere because they won't be able to stay, they won't be, their job won't be as attractive, attractive to them. Every time when we read newspaper headlines, we have to look at the science and see how things are working, what can we do, what was done elsewhere. People who are doing science and research right now, research in Quebec, for example, have to be receive solid support. I'd also like to say a few things about the CERB. It could be a victim of its own popularity, one might say, but there were a few cracks that were now shored up for, for example, volunteer firefighters, for artists and their royalties, and there are several components that were now fixed, such as people who receive dividends in small companies. So there are some, some improvements that were made that were made not just by various political parties, but by real people. They asked for these improvements. They're saying, what about us? They said. So proper discussions brought about solutions. As you know, people discussed the virtual parliament. We don't physically have to be sitting here on the benches to be able to discuss things. We can have discussions each at home and with various different types of formats, but we can do this. I don't. I understand that we do have to vote here, that there has to be a standardized system because we do have rules that can't be changed. We've talked about this. We've talked about a virtual parliament for quite some time. Unfortunately, in the spirit of openness, it's it's not too late. We looked at welcoming people from abroad not too long ago in various forms between Quebec and Canada. Mr. Speaker, I have to highlight that I'm very concerned. After everything we've done and everything we've said, after the knowledge we have about the percentage of cases of coronavirus that came from abroad, and I stress with the greatest respect and affection with respect to these people, I'm very concerned.
that 159 Mexican workers who were not given the COVID-19 test in Mexico and who were not quarantined in Mexico took a plane, landed in Dorval this morning, did not undergo a COVID-19 test in Canada, and were not quarantined in one of the thousands of hotel rooms that surround the airport. They were given to an organization that brought them in various regions of Quebec in the north and southern parts of Montreal. And knowing the characteristics of this virus and having statistics that saying between one quarter and one half of people who carry the virus don't have any symptoms and a test for someone who doesn't have symptoms could be useless, are we not taking a risk that we could easily eliminate. We communicated with the government privately on several occasions about this, and I say this with all due respect for the institutions and the people involved. I'm, I have an open mind, and I'd like to repeat that if the government could set aside billions for these measures, we should be able to invest to give rural communities in Quebec and Canada confidence. Our foreign workers should be quarantined and undergo a COVID-19 test. That is the best way to serve their countries of or origin and the workers as well. They don't have the necessary ex expertise. Companies can't say, oh, I'll make some room for these workers in the basement so they can be quarantined. That's not their duty. This is the state's duty. And it's up to the Canadian Customs who don't report to Quebec or other provinces that have to do this. The 159 workers who have already left their country, well, we should very quickly announce measures to isolate them when they arrive and give them COVID-19 tests. This could happen in Quebec and Canada, and they, then, then we'll be able to benefit our economy. And I'd like to say, Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, that we're thinking with respect to vigilant cooperation. I'm not uh, formulating any criticism here. We have the duty to remain vigilant with respect to each other, because every day we're looking at measures to solve new pro problems that are cropping up every day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're going to wait 30 seconds. We have a few technical changes, people to change places. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the last month, our world has changed dramatically. On Thursday, we learned that a million Canadians have lost their jobs. Now, this is not just a statistic. These are families that are now struggling to put food on the table, to pay for rent, to make ends meet. The government has moved to respond to this crisis, but in many cases, it's been too slowly. In early March, we had two suggestions. One, that the government should send direct financial assistance to all Canadians. And two, that we need a 75% wage subsidy, at least at a minimum, to ensure that people can keep their jobs and a subsidy that will support businesses in keeping workers on the payroll. Later today, we will be, and we've already supported the unanimous consent motion, but we'll be supporting the legislation to make this wage subsidy a reality. But I want to urge the government that while we're here in Ottawa, we should not leave here without knowing and without guaranteeing that all Canadians who need help get that help. The Canadian Emergency Response Benefit quite simply doesn't cover all Canadians who need this help. Too many Canadians may fall between the cracks. Too many Canadians may fall between the cracks, as I said. I've heard over the past weeks about the people who desperately need help 
but are unable to access that help because they don't meet all the criteria. I think about people working multiple jobs to make ends meet who've lost most of their hours of work and don't know how they're going to pay for groceries. They should be applying for help. I think about the freelance and contract workers who have lost most of their income and are maxing out their credit cards to pay their bills. They should be applying for help. I think about students who depend upon summer jobs to pay the rent, some who work to support their families. Now they have no jobs to apply for. They should be applying for help. Artists, self-employed, people who are just on the margins. In fact, there's so many examples and that's the problem. For the last several days, New Democrats have been working with the government to fix the gaps and that work is reflected in the motion that we've heard and in the work that will be done. I want to thank the Prime Minister and other members of government for the constructive way they've worked with us. But we're not done yet. The current system discourages people who need help from applying because they still have some income or they don't meet all the criteria. Yesterday, the minister confirmed that everyone who applies for the CERB will get it. So I asked the Prime Minister today, announce that the, all the criteria will be dropped and simply tell people, if you need help, apply for it and you'll get it. Let's keep it simple and let's make sure that everyone who needs help knows that they can apply for that help and that they will receive it. The only way we can get through this crisis if, is if we take care of each other. We are all connected. And we won't stop fighting until every Canadian gets the help they need, period. There have been heroes in this crisis in fighting COVID-19, and I want to also acknowledge those frontline workers who are keeping us fed, those who are keeping us healthy. It's saddening that they don't have the equipment they need to protect themselves and prevent the risk of infecting their families. I specifically want to mention healthcare workers who are often sleeping in their cars or sleeping in tents to prevent the spread of infection or the risk of infection to their families. We have to do better. We have to ensure that all workers have the protective equipment that they need to stay safe. During this crisis, I also believe it's important to make very clear that there is no room for companies profiting off the desperation of people. Credit card companies and others charging double-digit interest rates need to be stopped. And we need to use all our powers at the federal level to make sure that happens. Banks are continuing to charge interest, leaving people worse off with the mortgage deferral. And in fact, they are profiting off of this crisis. The finance minister I know has spoken with the banks, but clearly speaking nicely hasn't worked. Banks are regulated expressly by the federal government. The liberal government has to be prepared to use the powers we have to enforce pausing interest, putting a break on that. And in fact, what we also need to do is to put a pause on mortgages so that we can work with provinces to put a pause on rent. This should also apply for commercial rent, which would significantly help out small and medium-sized businesses. I know that in the coming weeks, we're going to start to talk about what a recovery would look like, how people will get back to work. And as we design this stimulus, I urge the Liberal government to not make the same mistakes of the past. Every public dollar that we spend must go to workers, not to CEOs. Executive bonuses and share buybacks, protecting shareholder profits, do not sustain or create jobs. We can stimulate the economy and make changes that will transform our country and fight climate change. 
We can build housing. We can invest in public transit. We can make it easier for Canadians to use renewable energy sources. We can make our houses and buildings as energy efficient as possible. And we can invest in child care services that all families can afford and that give our children the high quality education they deserve. I want to talk about Indigenous communities specifically. Over the last month, I've spoken with leaders across the country, Indigenous community leaders who've expressed very grave concerns around the lack of capacity for their communities to deal with a COVID-19 outbreak. These are communities as a result of historic and ongoing injustice that are without basic infrastructure, where washing one's hands with clean water is not often possible, where overcrowding and the lack of quality housing means physically distancing is also not a reality, where access to healthcare is severely limited to the point that the nearest ventilator for many communities is a flight away. I know the government has put some money on the table, but I've heard two specific concerns. One, that money is insufficient, and two, many Indigenous communities are finding it difficult to access that money. Historic neglect and racism has put Indigenous lives at greater risk of this virus. We have to do better, particularly the fact that in the coming weeks, many of these communities will face flooding, and this summer, they'll face forest fires. So we need a clear plan for safe evacuation of these communities and a clear strategy to ensure that these communities have the resources they need to respond to COVID-19. Indigenous lives matter, and we need to make sure we're prepared. Mr. Speaker, I believe in the, de the decisions. Mr. Speaker, I believe the decisions we make in the next weeks and months will be some of the most important if of our lives some of the most important that any Canadian government has been faced with. We believe in solidarity. We believe in helping one another. We hear a lot of people talking about when will things return to normal. But I believe we need to do far better than normal. Normal is workers not having paid sick leave. Normal is families struggling on a minimum wage. Normal is people who are essential to our health and safety not getting paid enough to live. Normal is a public health care system that has been starved of funding. Normal is a society that is neither fair nor resilient. We can't ever go back to normal. Canadians are showing their compassion. They're showing their desire to care for one another. We should demand that of our government as well. We should demand that this liberal, liberal government embrace those same values. Let's not return to the old normal. Let's build a new normal where we take better care of each other, where we have a strong social safety net that lifts us all up together. Let's build a Canada that is fair and resilient. Canadian, Canadians are counting on us. They're counting us to learn from this crisis, to build a better Canada for all of us. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to begin by recognizing that we're on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Unceded. Algonquin territory, and I thank them for again for hospitality and generosity. Magwitch. I also want to start by saying a large thank you. Merci à tous mes collègues. Thank you to all my colleagues for giving me the opportunity to speak on this very important day because it was through unanimous consent. Thank you very much. It means a lot to me that the Green Party is recognized in this place and allowed to speak as we gather in these entirely unprecedented times. I was moved by the Prime Minister's remarks in reminding us of Vimy. I hadn't planned to speak about Vimy, but April 9th this year, and I noticed my husband very depressed, he's sort of wandering about, and I said, what, what is, is, I'm thinking of my grandfather, who was machine gunned on Vimy, April 9th. 
1917. His grandfather survived, otherwise I wouldn't be married to my husband, I suppose. Uh, but my grand his grandfather, John Owen Wilson, survived, got back to British Columbia, and ended up as Chief Justice of the British Columbia Supreme Court. But the sacrifices of Vimy are not forgotten. The courage and solidarity of previous generations is not forgotten. I've thought in recent times that being a, a, a boomer in 1954 baby, I'm one of the last of a generation that remembers a time of the kind of solidarity and sacrifice, not that I lived through the war or the depression, but my parents did. And so the family stories become part of who you are. They're in your bones. The notion that government steps up, that government is on your side. And I think through years of neoliberalism, we've gotten this idea that government's kind of in our way, picking our pocket. I'm really relieved that in some ways, this solidarity, the social solidarity that we will have coming out of this pandemic will allow us to see, yeah, I'm part of my government. My democracy works for me. I hope that can be a lasting lesson. We are here together in a way that I want to acknowledge with deep gratitude. Is Parliament working well even when we're at a distance? I want to thank the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and so many different ministers for the openness to hear opposition ideas and concerns. If I could share with Canadians what the last couple of weeks have felt like working from home nonstop, 24-7. A lot of Canadians wouldn't imagine that every single day, 1.30 BC time, 4.30 in Ottawa, every day including Saturdays and Sundays, we have an opportunity to ask anything. Now in my mind, this is how the ideas have been working. It's quite true that a lot of the things we wanted weren't in the first bill in C-13. It's quite true that Greens, like others, said it shouldn't be a 10% wage subsidy, it should be 75%. We made that case and individual examples came forward. It feels to me as though through those daily question and answer sessions, and I know not every single day do all of us get our questions in. Some of us, the member for Carlton does well. I do pretty well. Push star one and go for it. We do our best to get our questions out there. But in my head, this is how it's been working. We raise a question. We say something like, what happens right now, Bishop, Bishop McMenemy has just contacted me and the Anglican Church on Vancouver Island has separate churches and they all have their own CRA number, but there's only one employer. So the 30% wage, you know, 30% revenue deduction, 30% reduction in revenue compared to some other reference period doesn't work at all in this circumstance. Then today, I look at the most recent version of the bill. Entity is redefined. It now covers that specific weird example of the Anglican Diocese and an issue raised to me by Bishop McMenemy. There may have been many other MPs who asked a question that stumped the Finance Canada senior officials that were on the telephone with us every single day. But when I see that in the bill, I think, oh, my question not only was a question, it flagged an issue. And this is what I hear from ministers. Keep sending us the specific concerns that you see. Keep telling us where the gaps are. Because the MPs on the ground right across Canada are the eyes and ears on the front line, able to say, nothing you've got in place right now, with all due respect, is working for small business. I'm terrified that a lot of very small businesses, seasonal businesses, restaurants and so on, are going to go under even with the wage subsidies. But then I pick up today's unanimous consent motion, well I saw it before coming here and I'm very relieved to see that it calls for the government to implement short term support measures for medium and small and medium sized enterprises to be partially refundable, primary objective, maintaining jobs, reducing the debt related to fixed costs. That's what I keep hearing from small business. They can't afford to pay the rent. The wage subsidy doesn't help them. So what I'm seeing here is not to be just a Pollyanna about our circumstances. But I do want to say that it means a lot to me that when we've come forward as individual MPs, opposition and liberal, and said, look, what's happening doesn't work. There's too many people, students, people in the gig economy. They're not covered by CERB. What are we going to do? 
Today's unanimous consent motion says we implement measures without delay. I think without delay would actually meet what the member for Burnaby South said, and right now today we say everybody applies. But that language suggests not that the government is saying, we've gotten this perfect, go away. What I hear from minister after minister is, we're learning. We're working as hard as we can. I want to say that I do know that the Minister of, Foreign, of Global Affairs and his parliamentary secretary have been available to me pretty much 24-7 for about the 50 or so constituents that I've so far worked to help get home. And I've still got about a dozen that I'm working on. This, I, and the parliamentary secretary knows well that I have someone stranded in Vanuatu. But there's a real sense of all hands on deck. And I want Canadians to know that. I want them to know that a spirit of nonpartisanship, of we are Team Canada, we're all in it together. Nothing exemplifies that for me more than the newfound best friend relationship between the Premier of Ontario and the Deputy Prime Minister. I think this shows stepping up to a circumstance where we're all at risk. We're thinking about being surrounded by death. We're thinking about wearing our masks. I've got Lysol wipes here below my desk. We are constantly vigilant. But we're also working together because we're Canadians. This must not be a moment that divides us. We must remember this and work differently in future. Yes, I want to press for guaranteed livable income. We will keep doing that. Yes, I want to press that we will, in this place and before too long, see new climate targets that meet the imperative of a looming disaster far greater than COVID-19, threatens to kill more people and wipe out civilization. It can't be postponed. But right now, what I want to say is a deep thank you for the spirit of collaboration. The Prime Minister spoke of the fact that this time, of course, is a t season of many religious observances. It is Passover. Happy Passover to my Jewish friends and family. It is also coming up soon to Vaiseki. And within a few weeks, it'll be Ramadan to my Islamic friends. A period of fasting and reflection. I'm just finishing Lent, a period of fasting and reflection. And it speaks to the unprecedented nature of the crisis that we're in, that as far as I've been able to determine through research from home and looking through every bit of constitutional and parliamentary history I can find, the Parliament of Canada has never before sat on Easter Saturday. Good Friday, particularly in previous generations, was held sacred. The idea of meeting on Easter weekend would have been impossible to imagine. But here we are. And why? In about, looking at the clock, I think, in about 10 hours, it will be dawn in Jerusalem. And the first morning light of that sunrise will strike the walls of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. It's built on the spot where we are told the original cave was in which the body of Jesus Christ was wrapped and placed in the tomb. The rock rolled in front of it. And that approximately 10 hours from now at dawn will be that remembrance of our stories, of our tradition, our faith, the most significant day, the most profound and important day of a Christian calendar, the resurrection of Christ, that the stone was rolled back and that those who loved him, Mary and others, came and thought the body had been stolen and the angels came to them and then Jesus, disguised as a gardener, came to them and said, no, he is risen. Now, in this time when we are surrounded by death and we are worried about our mortality, and those are the people we love. We can think of the things that are most important. And after this is over, we'll recognize, yes, we can survive. We can break the bonds of death. We can have faith in each other. We can invest ourselves in love for each other and our communities. We can remember what really matters. And right now, as I watch my grandkids on Zoom family chats, what would I give for a hug? I would love to think about our lives as transformed by this in ways that are profound, as we recognize that for the first time in my life, governments all around the world have decided without a hesitation, life is more important than money. We have deliberately and voluntarily shut down our economies to save lives. 
we have deliberately and voluntarily created for ourselves as lawmakers and as policymakers the challenge of an economic recovery because we didn't hesitate to know that saving life is more important than money. And when this is all over, and it Please, God, it's over with a minimum loss of life in Canada and all around the world, particularly worried for those, those countries that lack basic health care. We mustn't forget our obligations to the poorest of the poor, just as we don't forget Indigenous peoples in Canada, just as we don't forget those who are most marginalized, homeless. But when we get through this together, let's remember that in this pandemic, we discovered what really matters. Pursuant to order made earlier today, the House shall now resolve itself into a Committee of the Whole to consider matters related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we begin the debate, I would like to remind honourable members of how the proceedings will unfold for the next two hours. order made earlier today, during the proceeding of the committee, no, no, no member will be recognised for more than five minutes. Okay, so this is the uh, the end of formal speeches. We heard from, of course, all of the uh, party leaders inside the House about the wage subsidy uh, legislation. And now uh, the House of Commons will become what the Speaker called there, this committee of the whole, uh, when uh, essentially committee work gets done inside the House of Commons. There'll be a period of some questions and some answers from the government. Um, while we were doing that, I just wanted to say in the bottom right of your screen, there, uh, you saw the Quebec Premier François Legault not supposed to give a press conference today, but has shown up to give a press conference uh, where he confirmed that 31 people have died in a long-term care home uh, outside of Montreal in the month of March. Five of those are confirmed COVID cases. We'll bring more of that news to you as it unfolds. Here's Andrew Scheer asking his first question in this Committee of the Whole. The Deputy Prime Minister told this House that they were already, quote, leading a bulk national procurement effort to ensure Canadians have the necessary medical equipment. So can the Prime Minister please update this House as to how many ventilators he has secured and on what date they will reach Canadian hospitals? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. As we know, there is a uh, worldwide demand for uh, personal protective equipment and ventilators that uh, is, uh, is through the roof. Uh, we have therefore uh, both reached out to suppliers of medical products that Canada has long worked with uh, around the world, uh, as well as seen unprecedented efforts by Canadian industry uh, to deliver uh, ventilators that will be made in Canada. I I can uh, assure people that the uh, approach is working. We are seeing uh, production of ventilators in Canada begin. Uh, it will be still a few weeks before uh, they are able to arrive. Uh, and in the meantime, we continue to uh, work to procure them from around the world. Position Leader. Mr. Speaker, on March 25th, the Finance Minister told the Senate that help for the energy sector was coming within, quote, hours or days and not weeks. It has now been two and a half weeks s since that date with no announcement. Reports are circulating that a proposal did in fact go to Cabinet, but that it was rejected. So is it the Prime Minister's position that there will in fact be no help for Canada's energy sector and the tens of thousands of Canadians that it employs? The Honourable Prime Minister. We recognize the triple challenges faced by workers in the energy sector right now. Uh, that has uh, been extraordinarily difficult for people in Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, and Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, the low oil prices have long been a challenge. On top of that, uh, the COVID crisis on economic terms has uh, led to a uh, lowering of demand for oil as people uh, don't travel nearly as much as normal. Uh, and at the same time, the uh, health crisis crisis has uh, let people into isolation and remaining to stay home uh, and families across the country uh, are suffering from this but particularly those uh, in Alberta in the oil sector. That is why we moved quickly on two measures to help uh, as many people as we could across the country. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit and uh, the wage subsidy at 75 percent. There will be more coming uh, for the oil sector as we develop uh, sectoral solutions. 
The Honourable Opposition Leader. Well, he left out the quadruple challenge, Mr. Speaker, and that was his government's cancelling of projects. And remember, it was his finance minister that promised it was coming in days, not weeks. The people who are suffering because of this crisis are suffering in real time and cannot afford to wait longer. Mr. Speaker, documents now reveal that in early January, military intelligence began producing detailed technical reports about the outbreak of the deadly coronavirus in Wuhan, China. A yes or no question. Does the Prime, did the Prime Minister see these reports, yes or no? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as members of the Five Eyes, we were privy to uh, significant uh, military and uh, intelligence reports on the status of things happening around the world. Uh, there were enough flags for us to convene an incident response group uh, at the end of January. Uh, we also began increasing screening at major airports uh, and limiting flights from Wuhan. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, these are very simple yes or no questions. Was this information from the mil military intelligence report shared with the Public Health Agency of Canada, yes or no? The Honourable Prime Minister. From the beginning, Mr. Speaker, we worked with all uh, agencies to ensure that the relevant information uh, was shared across departments. We needed to make the best possible decisions based on recommendations from scientists, from health researchers, uh, from international allies, and that's what we did. The uh, opposition leader. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's wage subsidy uh, that we will be uh, uh, d debating uh, throughout the day today is a uh, lifeline to those companies who can still afford to pay any wages at all. There remains a significant number of businesses across the country who are receiving no revenue, who aren't able to, to pay any wages at all because they've had their doors closed for almost a month now. The Conservatives have put forward the idea of rebating the GST to allow those small businesses that have no revenue at all to pay some of their bills, to pay their rents, so that they can stay open when this crisis is over, so they can reopen when this crisis is over. Will the Prime Minister consider this proposal to ensure that there are jobs for Canadians to go back to at the end of this pandemic? Prime Minister. A number of people uh, in this House, uh, we are extremely pleased with the level of, uh, of collaboration, of input from all par parliamentarians and all parties as we look to ensure that we're helping Canadians as much as possible in this, uh, in this situation. We've moved forward on a wage subsidy, we've moved forward on a Canada emergency response benefit, we've moved forward on uh, low interest loans uh, of which 25 per cent, $10,000 uh, will be forgivable for small businesses. We recognize there's more to do and we look forward to continuing to work uh, with all parliamentarians to make sure we're helping Canadians in the right way. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon. In keeping with what I said before, we do have some concerns about health and safety and the arrival of people who are very welcome in Canada, in Quebec. They are temporary foreign workers, but we're concerned about their safety. My question to the Prime Minister is, in the next few hours before more temporary foreign workers arrive at Dorval Airport in Montreal, can steps be taken so that these people are quarantined uh, at customs before they're released uh, to go elsewhere in the country, and this in the interest of all Canadians? The Honourable Prime Minister, we recognize that our top obligation is to provide for Canadians' safety and security, and so when people arrive at our borders, that's essential. We know how important it is to ensure food security as well. The food supply chain is very important to maintain in this country, and temporary foreign workers play an important role in that food supply. We have strict rules around quarantine, and foreign workers arriving in Canada have to be isolated for 14 days in an adequate manner to ensure that they do not spread the COVID-19 virus. We will continue continue to work with all our partners and all the authorities to make sure that those rules are always followed. The Honourable Member for Belle-Chambly. 
Mr. Speaker, it's possible that the rules are inadequate. It's possible that firms are not in a position to ensure the type of quarantine that's needed. It's possible that symptoms are not being identified as effectively on the firm as they could be if, they, if those uh, tests were conducted by health authorities. These people have been released by Customs Canada, and the responsibility to look after these people has been basically the buck has been passed to firm owners to do the government's job. So I repeat my question, will steps be taken in the next few hours uh, to see to this situation, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Yes, Mr. Speaker. I share many of the concerns listed by the member for Belle Chambly. We will work together to make sure that while meeting the needs of our farmers and our food supply chain, we do have the capacity and the certainty that Canadians are kept safe and that the possible spread of COVID-19 is limited. I intend to continue to work with not just the provinces and the farm sector, but also with my partners in the opposition. Now, member for Belle Chambly, Mr. Speaker, on a completely different note, some may be surprised to hear me say this. I do believe that the government of Canada has to contribute to re-establishing jobs in the oil patch in Western Canada. I don't think those people should be expected to completely sacrifice their economic model. But when it comes to any further expansion of the energy sector, that should involve financial resources that are transferred toward the renewable energy sector. Again, in Western Canada, where there are specific needs, can this situation be taken as an opportunity? The status quo ante should be restored for workers in the oil patch, but could those jobs be shifted to renewable energies? Right Honourable Prime Minister, I'd like to thank the member for his perspective. It's important to support workers and families who are going through tough times in all industries, all across the country, including the oil patch. But we recognize that we're also engaged in a battle against climate change, and we need to find ways to create good jobs for people in Alberta and elsewhere who want to have jobs that will last for years and generations. And that's why we've been thinking together with the government of Alberta and other countries about ways to ensure that Canada and Alberta are part of that shift, that transition to a better future for our country. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to just raise again the concern. Uh, we've heard stories that represent some of the millions of Canadians that are right now falling through the cracks who cannot access the CERB. We've heard of people who've got multiple jobs, who've lost a lot of that work but still get some income, freelance and contract workers, artists, self-employed. Uh, while the government has committed, and I'm encouraged by that, to fixing those gaps, will the Prime Minister just today stand up and say that if anyone needs help, they should just apply while the government is fixing the gaps in the system, but people who need help should just apply right now. Honourable Prime Minister. The immediate urgency in uh, this situation was making sure uh, that people across the country who were reliant on paychecks to be able to pay their groceries and pay their rent, paychecks that suddenly disappeared because of COVID-19, get money quickly. That's what we did with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and I want to take a moment to thank the extraordinary public servants uh, uh, at uh, Canada, Revenue Canada, but across uh, ministries and departments who worked incredibly hard to create a model that would get money out quickly to millions of Canadians. We, of course, recognize there are gaps and are working with all parliamentarians to fill those gaps because people who need help should be getting it. Member for Burnaby South. Will the Prime Minister just say today really clearly that if you need help, 
You can apply right now for the CERB while the government fix the gaps. But will the Prime Minister just say very clearly to all Canadians, if you need help, apply now while the government fixes the problems? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we created a program that is helping millions upon millions of Canadians who've lost their paychecks because of COVID-19. We've moved forward with another program that we're debating here today uh, on wage subsidies for people so they can keep their jobs, keep their paychecks at 75% subsidy uh, from the government. That will keep people linked to their employment. But we recognize there are other people in different situations who also need help. S uh, students, seniors, uh, uh, part-time workers, essential workers who need extra help to keep in their jobs, and that is what we are focused on right now with uh, tremendous collaboration from all parliamentarians. Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, credit unions uh, have recently, some of them have recently waived interest rates entirely. Zero percent interest rates is what they're charging on their credit cards, while banks are still charging astronomical interest rates. The six big banks in Canada, BMO, CIBC, National Bank, RBC, Scotiabank, and TD, reported more than $46.5 billion in profits last year. Will the government, will the Prime Minister, use the federal powers to force those banks to waive interest rates entirely during this crisis? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance uh, has been closely engaged with the banks over these past weeks. We've seen uh, strong movement by the banks in terms of uh, helping people who are particularly hard hit uh, financially because of COVID-19. Uh, they've uh, agreed to uh, help us administer the, so, the small business loan. Uh, we know that there is more that the banks can do, and we've been working with banks and credit unions uh, to make sure that they do more to recognize that the way we support Canadians through this situation uh, will ensure that we come out of this situation in the best possible shape, all of us. Member for Burnaby South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during the 2008 financial crisis, we saw bailouts that effectively bailed out corporations who then took the money, left Canada, and left workers high and dry. The workers lost their jobs taking, while those companies, those corporations, took billions of dollars from, from Canada. Uh, will the government ensure that we're going to prohibit any CEO bonuses and stock buybacks and the companies that receive government subsidies or bailouts, that money goes towards workers that with strings attached to keeping people employed, not uh, enriching the corporation or the shareholders or the executives, but it goes with strings attached to workers directly. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the challenges and crises past that uh, had some of the impacts that the member opposite has talked about. Uh, that is why we made sure that the big measures we put forward are entirely focused on Canadians, on workers. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit helps people who've lost their job because of COVID-19. The wage subsidy makes sure that people uh, are staying connected to their jobs even though they can't get paid by their employer anymore because the government will pay them uh, up to 75% of their, of their salary uh, so that when this is through, uh, Canadians will still have connection to those jobs and our economy can get going again. Everything we've done has been focused first and foremost on Canadians and not on uh, corporations as a nebulous entity. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Thank you. A yes or no question. The military intelligence warned of the deadly coronavirus in a briefing to the government in early January. Uh, yes okay, we no. are going to pull away now from uh, this question and answer session between a limited number of MPs, parliamentarians inside the House of Commons. If you want to continue watching, you can do so at cbc.ca. We're streaming it live there. Uh, but of course, this is uh, the beginning of debate around the wage subsidy legislation, which everyone has agreed upon and will be passed, we expect, by the end of the day. But this was an opportunity here and will continue to be uh, for opposition parties to ask some questions, rather detailed questions of the government. Uh, in, in regards to their response to the pandemic. And let me bring in the CBC's Catherine Cullen from our Parliamentary Bureau, who's also been watching with me. Um, not sure where you want to start there, Catherine, and what, what stood out for you in terms of the kinds of questions. It, it is, I, I think, important to see the questions and answers, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we will continue to monitor them, of course. 
Yeah, an important moment for the opposition party, certainly, um, to, to, to essentially show their value in this whole process right now, right? As we talk about the value of parliament and holding the government to account, I thought there were a few interesting points there. Um, particularly when Andrew Scheer pressed the Prime Minister on what was happening with aid to the oil patch. Uh, mm -hmm. And at one point, the Prime Minister did say there will be more coming for the oil sector as we look at, as we look at sectoral solutions. And uh, uh, Mr. Scheer raised the point that this is something the government has said specifically, aid for the oil patch that is coming for some time, that at one point Bill Morneau, in fact, said it was something that would be hours, days, and in fact is now taking weeks. Uh, and we have seen the government broaden the kind of language they are talking about. At first, lots of questions about the oil patch uh, specifically because, of course, they're also dealing on top of everything else with the impact of uh, low oil prices, mm -hmm. historically low oil prices. Um, more and more we hear the government talking not only about the oil and gas sector, but also talking about help for airlines, help for the hospitality industry. And so we're still waiting to see precisely what form that would take in addition to the kinds of measures that we're seeing today and talking about today, Rosemary, um, with the wage subsidy. It was also interesting to see the Prime Minister pressed on reporting by uh, the CBC's own Murray Brewster about these intelligence reports that came from a uh, specific and frankly, I think, little known portion of the military the, the, that looks specifically at intelligence that has to do with health issues. And the Prime Minister was asked again and again, and we heard uh, Pierre Poiliev raising the question once again, when did you get the information? Did you see these reports? When did you know of the threat uh, posed by the coronavirus, specifically from this intelligence unit? The Prime Minister, though, not really being very specific about that. He said, of course, we have access to intelligence sharing from our partners, uh, but didn't say specifically whether he personally saw those reports, because Mary Brewster's reporting says it would have been shared within national defense, but it's not clear whether or not that information would have been passed along to public health. And uh, we see here the prime minister as well. Um, also interesting, I thought Jagmeet Singh really trying to push there uh, the NDP's point of view that the uh, emergency response benefit should be open to all Canadians. He tried to pin the prime minister down there and say, why don't you just say that anybody who needs this help can access it? Prime Minister pivoted, though, and said, listen, we're finding ways to help millions of people, and we are still looking at ways uh, to help them further, but certainly not the answer that Mr. Singh was looking for. No, the NDP has been pushing for this universal benefit. Basically, mm -hmm. everybody gets money. I should point out that right now, 5.6 million Canadians have applied for the CERB, which is about 30 percent of the workforce. So it, it is probably getting to the people, first and foremost, who don't have a job. Uh, and the government's been very reticent to go down the path of, of a payment to everybody, particularly. Yeah, because everybody doesn't need it. Okay, Catherine Cullen, thank you for all your help with the coverage today. Appreciate it very much. Uh, let's go now to, to someone directly waiting for this wage subsidy legislation to be passed. Michael Carmichael is the president and CEO of Up Auto, and he owns four car dealerships and has had to lay off more than half of his staff. He joins us now from Toronto. Good to see you there. Hi, good morning, or afternoon, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, Michael, um, you have, uh, you, you've left off, you've laid off half your staff. Um, yeah. Have you informed yourself about the wage subsidy program? Is it something you might be interested in using? Uh, 100%. And, and I'll tell you, it's something that when we heard about it, uh, we were very interested to learn more about it. And, you know, as I sit here and watch them bantied about in the House of Commons, it's like, let's just get going with this <laughs> uh, because we need it. How many people have you laid off then so far? Uh, 26 people of 50. Of 50. Uh, and, yeah. and business has, I imagine, entirely shut down or is there is there anything coming in at all? So we're still, uh, we're deemed an essential service in Ontario and there's some real confusion around whether or not we can, you know, in selling of cars with test drives and um, uh, signing paperwork. So there's uh, some gray area there, uh, but we are open for sale uh, for service and parts because mm -hmm. people, you know, have flat tires and dead batteries and we're there sure. to do that. But it is it is not business as normal. So if uh, presumably this is going to get passed and get royal assent uh, today, uh, today mm -hmm. the finance minister suggested it might be more like uh, two to five weeks now, so a little bit shorter than they had initially thought. Uh, mm -hmm. w will you be willing to hire back all those people you've laid off? Well, the challenge uh, we've got right now is uh, is just making sure that we've got um, you know a, a line of sight to getting through this. So liquidity and, and cash flow is, is critical right now. So how we're looking at it is we've brought back uh, two people, uh, knowing that that, uh, that that wage subsidy is is in process. Uh, we are not laying off anybody else right now, but we're trying to get an idea of you know if we're in this for 18 months. 
uh, as the Prime Minister indicated, as we look at uh, the other side of this with or without a vaccine um, or uh, some sort of measures to, uh, to address the virus itself, it's, it's a long time to look, look forward. And as we're managing our cash flow, uh, we're not making any moves right now uh, other than those first immediate ones we've made. We're not laying anyone off. We brought mm-hmm. two people back who are mission critical um, because the wage subsidy made a material difference in those, those two rehires. So if, if, if you got 75%, up to 75% for, for the rest of your employees, uh, and you could bring them back, uh, do you see the benefit that the government is talking about when they say it's important to maintain that connection between employee and employer? Oh, 100%. It, uh, it's, it's, it's critically important. And, and we've undertaken measures already with the team that has been laid off. We are uh, communicating frequently, keeping them up to date with the various uh, employment uh, um, uh, subsidies, the, uh, the CERB, and making sure everyone understands how that works. Uh, maintaining momentum in our, uh, in our team is of the utmost importance. The challenge and the balance as a business owner is looking forward at saying, okay, if we're in this for uh, 18 months with our revenues down over 60% in the last uh, two weeks of March, um, uh, how, how much cash can we burn for how long? So it's a balancing act right now. And I think as, as you know, the, the other side of this becomes clear and we start to see consumer confidence, um, absolutely we will be bringing people back as quickly uh, as possible. But right now it's trying to understand if we're in this for 18 months, uh, you know, we need to make some, some decisions on cash flow and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and how much we can afford to be um, kind of investing in that other 25% that, that we would be putting, putting forward to bring people back. Okay, Michael, I know you represent a lot of voices right now, and uh, let's hope they get this done today so you can start to tap into this for, for you and your employees. Appreciate it, sir. Absolutely agreed on that. Thank you. Okay, Michael Carmichael, President and CEO of Up Auto. All right, uh, again, the debate continues on the wage subsidy legislation. You can watch it on our website. We are expecting the finance minister, Bill Morneau, to appear in front of the Senate later this afternoon. He will answer questions from senators. And if all goes according to plan, and that's not always a given here in Ottawa, uh, this legislation should receive royal assent tonight. And the finance minister suggested today it could be available uh, to employers within two to five weeks. As that was happening, and we will bring you up to date on this <clears throat> right after a short commercial, but uh, Quebec's premier did appear at a press conference where he confirmed that 31 people have died in that one long-term care home, five of them because of COVID, but the police have now been called in to look into what happened in that long-term care home, uh, the premier calling it a case of gross negligence, and now 40 home care, uh, long-term care centres in the province will now be looked at by public health officials, as, of course, uh, the elderly, the older people in our population continue to be the most vulnerable in this pandemic. The Prime Minister is taking tomorrow off off for his briefing and Monday to spend some time with his family. He will be back again on Tuesday, and so, so will I. Michael Serapio will pick up your coverage for the rest of the day. Thank you. Take care.